Girlfriend called me disgusting and accused me of cheating for using a flashlight. So my girlfriend and I have been together for one year. Last night, I tried initiating sex with her, but she told me no. No big deal. I went to our room to masturbate. She walked in on me and saw me with my flashlight. She started screaming at me, telling me that I was disgusting for even owning something like that and that it was the same thing as cheating. I tried to tell her that she has toys of her own, but she told me those are not the same. She left crying and went home. I tried texting her, but she's not responding. What do I do? Now in the comments, quote, I tried telling her she has toys of her own, but she told me those are not the same. Um, yes they are. She says that since it's easier for me to achieve an orgasm than it is for her, I shouldn't need a toy. Lamal, she's really reaching there. She doesn't get to control your masturbation. This crap is ridiculous. She is literally being insecure about a goddamn flashlight as if it's gonna take her man. She's wrong and a hypocrite. If she's allowed to have and use toys, so are you. And who's allowing toys for masturbation? What I do by myself with my body is my business alone. Crap, dude. I buy my man flashlights. If it was cooking his dinner and he was taking it on dates, I'd be pissed, but it's a freaking piece of rubber shaped like a puss. She sucks. A flashlight is a masturbatory aid, just like a dildo or vibrator. It is not the same as cheating, and she has to change her perception of that, especially if she uses toys herself. How long have you been dating? I'm not sure you can convince her it's not cheating if she doesn't see the parallels already between yours and her sex toys. And OP says, We've been dating for about a year. She said that my toys and hers are different because it's easier for me to achieve orgasm than it is for her. Whoa, yikes. I think this whole situation needs some time and space. I'm sure she was not expecting to see that and it probably hit a bunch of insecurities for her. Give her a little bit of space to process and hopefully she'll see that she kind of overreacted. If she doubles down on this though, I'm not sure I could handle a relationship with someone who was that insecure and controlling about sex and masturbation. And now onto the update. Since the last post got a few questions that I didn't make clear originally, I thought I'd clear them up first. Why did you call it our room if she later left to go to her house? We both have our own places, but we both spend so much time at each other's that we call the bedrooms our room. Why did you leave her alone and go masturbate if she was visiting your house? She had been here since Friday and wasn't supposed to leave until Sunday. Since we had a few days left, I didn't think it would be a big deal to go and take care of myself for a few minutes and then come back to her. Didn't she know that you have a flashlight? I don't use it often because I find the cleaning to be kind of annoying, so it's a every few months kind of thing for me. It didn't come up before this. And now to the update. Yesterday, she contacted me for the first time since she left and asked to meet up. When we did, she reiterated all of what she said. She felt that using a flashlight was cheating, that it was disgusting for me to own one, and that I should have tried harder to convince her if I was in the mood. According to her, flashlights are objectifying towards women and that men who use them are pathetic. I asked her how it was any different from her owning a dildo, to which she replied that dildos are normal while flashlights are just weird. She expected me to apologize if the relationship was to have any chance. After hearing her call me disgusting twice now, I didn't feel like apologizing, nor that I was in the wrong, and that the relationship had any chance. We broke up and went our separate ways. Talk about double standards. And she's 31? Female? Going on 13. You know she's gonna go around telling people he loved his fake vagina more than me. OP, prepare yourself. It blows my mind that someone would prefer to be coerced into sex by their partner rather than them just taking care of their own needs as necessary. This poor girl has a lot of confusion and negative experiences ahead of her. What a shame. She actually said that you should have tried harder to convince her. What happened to no means no? She chose to not participate and you attended to your needs the way you wished to. A flashlight was the method you used. What would she have said if you had just used your hand? That you were cheating on her with yourself? 
The try to convince her thing is what got me. Seems like him respecting her no and taking care of himself is a hell of a lot better than trying to pressure her when he's in the mood. That double standard though, awful all round. Super weird. I can't believe a woman is like, how dare you masturbate? You should pressure me more. That seems like a recipe for resentment and a really unhealthy dynamic where he has to convince her to have sex every time and there is no clear boundary around just not wanting to and that being okay and the other partner needs to deal with that in whatever way they find appropriate. Honestly, I think breakup is a good outcome for OP because it seems like a manipulative dynamic of I control when you are aroused and the toy is just whatever she's latched onto so she can avoid saying how dare you jerk off when I say no to sex. I bet if he had been using porn or a dildo or something else, it would be the same reaction. She's insecure and wants to be the hill his attraction lives and dies on. I've known guys who are like this with vibrators or previous lovers, etc. I have a feeling this wasn't about toys at all. This seems like the girlfriend wanted out of the relationship and wasn't mature enough to just end it. She had to make it his fault somehow. If she wanted out, why would she reach out to OP to ask him to ask her forgiveness? I mean, I guess some people are just nonsensical. I don't think there is a lot of logic from her regardless of the truth, but I took it as, look, I tried to forgive him, I am so magnanimous, but he was the one who didn't apologize properly for his heinous act. People who pull this have to make themselves the victim, or she was truly, genuinely that stupid of a hypocrite. Also possible, lol. Unexposed is titled, Am I the asshole for telling my sister the real reason why my parents haven't come to see my newborn son? So me, 26 male, and my boyfriend, 26 male, had a baby less than a couple of weeks ago. My boyfriend is trans, born female, then transitioned to male, but I knew him for years before he came out, and I was in love with him all those years. He was too. That didn't change after he came out, but it was a lot to mentally process for me. We had a drunk one night stand, and he found out he got pregnant. We are together as a couple raising our son. My family knows everything about this, but they are huge transphobes. Before we got together, they had lots of negative opinions when he started making changes. It bothered me so much. Then I told them that we were having a baby and they lost their crap. A few months ago, they seemed like they came around until they said, maybe motherhood will change her mind. And yeah, I didn't want that crap around us. We had a fight, I told them they are not allowed around our baby until they accept my boyfriend and keep their crap to themselves. They haven't contacted me at all, even after my son was born, so that told me they don't want to come around. My sister doesn't know about our fight. She was really excited to become an aunt, so a few days ago she came to meet him. When we were talking, she said how our parents haven't come and I let her. They told her that I supposedly wasn't letting anyone meet the baby for a few months because my boyfriend said so, but I told her no. It pissed me off that they tried to put the blame on him, so I told her everything, and she was of course mad, and she even called them outside to yell at them. The thing is, my sister is like their golden child. They care way more about her and will do anything to be around. Like when she moved for college a few hours away, they moved too. Everything is for her. So she was so mad that she stopped talking to them and now they are mad because my sister is pulling away from them for how they are being with us. The reason they think I'm the asshole and why I'm wondering if I'm the asshole is because this was a separate issue between me and them and didn't involve her at all. But now she's involved and doesn't want anything to do with them, which they are super devastated about. I don't know if I made the right move telling her why. I'm very mad at them, so to them, it comes off as petty telling her knowing how she would react. Am I the asshole? Now in the comments, not the asshole. They are transphobic. They chose their sides. Also, your boyfriend must be dysphoric as hell from being pregnant. Give him extra support. Nope, no way, no how, not the asshole. Bigots don't get to hide. Call out every bigot you see. They did this to themselves with their own backwards thinking and attitudes. Lol at didn't involve her at all. The second that they lied to her, she became involved, even before you said anything. Totally not the asshole. Look, 
On some level, I can't blame them for lying to her. They knew they were being assholes, they knew she wouldn't approve, and they didn't want her to be mad at them. But you have no obligation to back up their lie. Not the asshole. Your sister was lied to by them. They got caught in a lie, a huge one, and I have no idea how they were expecting it to end. You did nothing wrong, and your sister is probably seeing another side of her parents. Moving when she went to college sounds excessive. Were they trying to control her? You were never required to keep secrets to protect the guilty. Well done on your sister for being supportive. She is sibling, Ing, right. Stay close to her. She sounds worth it. And mazel tov on that baby. Give him a kiss and a belly zibit from me. And now onto the update. I know it's been a while since posting this, but wanted to leave a happy update. Well, bittersweet, but more sweet than bitter. Thank you for the support on my post. It sucked at first, feeling like it was me that ruined the relationship my sister had with our parents. In order to ease some of the stuff I was feeling, her and I talked. As much as my parents' transphobia pissed me off, I honestly didn't want her to feel like she had to pick sides. She didn't even let me finish talking about how if she wanted to keep a relationship with them some point down the line, even if it doesn't include me or my sons, she's free to do that. All she had to say about that was, hell no, and that they are not true family if they can't get past their bullcrap for my sake or their grandkids, and she was so disgusted with them. My sister was really cool letting me know this is all on them, 100%. It helped me to have that reassurance, so I'm glad we were able to talk it out. She had her own thing about feeling sad about the whole situation, so for a while, she was coming over a lot to watch my son while me and his daddy had some alone time. She basically pushed us out of our own place because she wanted auntie slash nephew bonding time. My parents are blocked everywhere. We haven't heard from them in over a month. She's done trying to reason with them, so neither of us have any communication. Of course, that brought the wrath of the rest of our family, but once they heard why, they backed off a bit too. Aside from that drama, we are happy. My son has got an auntie that loves him so much. Also, my boyfriend and I, or should I say husband, got married last weekend. A small courthouse ceremony, but it was still just as exciting and wonderful. My sister was there for support. Then we celebrated at my husband's family's house with our son. Not gonna lie, there was a moment when my thoughts were on my parents, but then I reminded myself that they are the ones actually missing out. My sister being there as my support and reminding me every time that this was all their own fault helps me not to feel too sad about it. My family is what is important in the end. And now in the comments, it's heartwarming to, for once, hear about a golden child who has got their head on straight and has a good relationship with their sibling. And OP says, she was treated like the golden child but never acted like one and it never affected our relationship. I am very grateful for that. Yeah, that was my brother too. I was the scapegoat, but our mom being how she was just drove us closer. I still thank him for helping raise me on Father's Day and he calls me on Mother's Day. A very wholesome update. Sorry your parents are massive assholes, but I'm so glad that you have your sister there for you. Congratulations on getting married. Wishing all four of you the best. And OP says, Yeah, at the end of the day, it's them who are missing out. I've got my husband, our son, my sister, and his whole family as our support. Truly blessed to have these wonderful people in my life. Thank you. We are so happy about it. All week, anytime I look at him, I'm going, Yeah, that's my husband right there. Friendly PSA that hormone replacement therapy is not birth control. The effects on fertility are highly variable. If there's a chance of sperm meeting egg when you and your partner have sex, then there is a chance that you'll become a parent. I would imagine pregnancy would be a pretty intense period of dysphoria. I can't imagine that plus insane in-laws. It's a very case-by-case -case thing. Just imagining being pregnant is enough to deeply upset me, but others feel differently. I don't experience any dysphoria in any way, but with reproduction. This is a prime example of, you have the freedom to say whatever you like. That doesn't free you from the consequences of your words and beliefs. OP's parents can pretend this has nothing to do with anyone else, but it involves their whole family. How awful. 
I can't imagine choosing some backwards bullcrap religion or bigotry over my kid's happiness and a relationship with my grandkid. Madness. My friend is addicted to video games, all she does is play video games, and now she is making her child do nothing but play video games. My friend plays video games every spare moment she has. Unfortunately, I am not exaggerating this at all. She does so at the expense of everything else in her life. She neglects to do anything but the basics for her child, has exchanged real life friendships for in-game friendships, and her games have become her number one priority above even her child and husband. Now she started sitting her child in front of video games and having the child play for all hours during the days and evenings. Her child is bright, smart, and clearly wants to do something more with my friend, but video games are the only thing the child gets. There have been a few times when I've been speaking to my friend, and I can hear her child in the background saying things like, Mommy, I'm hungry, I want breakfast. And my friend will tell her child to wait, Mommy needs to finish something in the game first. I'm at a point now where I'm not only worried about the state of our friendship, but I'm also worried for her child's well-being. I don't think she is neglecting her child in the sense of failing to feed or anything like that, but the poor kid basically spends the days tucked away in a corner of the house playing video games and entertaining themselves. Sadly, my friend's husband is no different and spends most of his time on video games. I've tried to talk to my friend in the past about my concerns and though she has agreed her gaming is excessive, she always gets defensive and says something along the lines of, I'm trying to get better, why isn't that good enough? I'm a gamer myself, so I'm not the video games are evil type of person, but her playing is out of control. She works for eight hours a day and then games when she's off from work until late into the night. I've even seen her playing during work hours as she works from home. Weekdays are spent on video games. How do I approach her about this? It's eating away at me, watching my friend's life crumble and watching her child pushed aside like that, all for the sake of video games. I know that she's an adult and she can make her own decisions, but as her friend, I feel like not saying something is doing a disservice to her and our friendship. Help. And now in the comments, this advice is coming from how I handle things and may not be the best for you. I would come at this indirectly. Hey, what game have you been playing recently? If you already know, replace that. If you can get her to hold a conversation, naturally turn it toward her kid and the rest of her life. Go from there. And OP says, thank you, I appreciate it. I've tried bringing it up regarding her child and how I've noticed them playing a lot of games lately, and my friend's answer is always, isn't it cute? My friend just seems to think that she's doing her child good by spending time with them and can't see the harm she's doing. Wait, 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 are they playing games together? The way you phrased it, I thought she was playing on her own and sticking him in another room or something. And OP says, she plays her own game and then has her child in another game at the same time in the corner away from her and frames it as bonding. But it's not. It's simply a way to keep her kid out of the way while she plays her own games. When I say that every spare moment is spent on video games, I'm not being hyperbolic. She will log out of work, go downstairs and log on to a video game. As a family, they don't sit down to eat together. She does nothing but the absolute bare minimum as a mother, and sometimes she doesn't even do that. It's becoming increasingly alarming. Edit, I should also have mentioned that her child is four. Unfortunately, it's not your place to be able to tell anyone how to parent. You don't know what health issues are occurring on her behalf. If you were truly concerned for the child, you should either call CPS or offer to care for the child yourself. If the child has food, clothing, and other needs, then there isn't much else you or anyone else can do about it. Telling someone how to parent is a fast track to getting ignored and blocked out of someone's life. So if you actually care about the child, you'll have to do some legwork of your own. Another option is to pull away and to wait to be confronted about why you don't show up anymore to visit. You can easily frame it by saying, I feel uncomfortable being around you and your child who plays video games all day. It doesn't sit right with me, and the story I tell myself is, hey, this precious kid isn't getting enough attention, so it makes me feel uneasy to sit around and watch a child sit in a corner and game all day. Take some time to focus on yourself and quietly observe. Are you there with her every night? Do you watch how she interacts with her kid? 
When you view things from the outside, you don't see everything. Also, if you don't have kids of your own, you will be smart to absolutely mind your own business. My best advice is to simply focus on yourself, unless the child is being beaten or abused or severely neglected, your options will have deep negative effects for that friendship. If their family wants to game for 8 hours a day, that's their prerogative. It sucks, I know, but you can't control other people, only yourself. However, if she is truly neglecting the child, CPS is a phone call away. It's not your job to be your friend's co-parent. And now on to update one. So I posted a week ago about my friend who was addicted to video games and does nothing else, and I was worried that she was putting her daughter aside and also making her daughter just sit in a corner to play video games all day. Unfortunately, I was right, but the situation is actually worse than I thought. I spoke to my friend about my concerns, and she broke down, telling me how much she hates being a mother, wishes she never had her daughter, and how much having a child ruined her and her husband's life. She didn't come right out and say that she's been neglecting her daughter, but we had a very long phone conversation, and as I listened to what she was saying, it became very clear that her daughter is not properly cared for. For the sake of keeping this short, here is my dilemma. During our conversation, she asked me if my husband and I would be willing to take her daughter for a while in order for her and her husband to work on their relationship and their lives. Her daughter is the same age as my son, we FaceTime frequently, and they really like each other. Her daughter is also such a sweet little girl, very well behaved, smart, and just all around a very wonderful four-year-old. However, my friend lives halfway across the country, which means her daughter would be here completely without her parents, and they would not even be able to visit. Also, when I asked my friend how long a while would be, she can't give me a firm answer. She said something along the lines of, maybe just a month or two, maybe longer. It would be so cute if our kids could go to school together. In her province, kids don't go to school until five, but where I live, they go to school at four, so it sounds like she intends for me to keep her daughter for much longer than just a month or two. I'm so conflicted. On one hand, having a second kid here to care for would be so difficult for me, even though she's well behaved, and I do work 40 plus hours a week from home, so I know it would be doubling the work for me. On the other hand, I know that the only family my friend and her husband have out there is her husband's parents, who are much older and not willing to take their daughter at all. I'm sick to my stomach thinking of this poor girl stuck in that house with who knows what's going on. My husband and I have been talking about it, and we just can't come to a decision. He feels the same as me. Their daughter needs a better, stable living situation, and we can give it to her. But should we? Any advice and or opinions would be much appreciated. I feel like outside perspectives would be very helpful. Thank you. Edit to add, my friend's husband is of the same mindset as my friend. He's currently a stay-at-home dad, not of his own choice, but simply because he lost his job shortly after COVID happened. He cares for their daughter during the day, but has openly admitted how much he hates it. My friend is the one that strong-armed him into having a child, which to me is ridiculous, as my opinion is that you shouldn't allow someone to force you into doing something you don't want. And he has admitted that he doesn't enjoy being a dad. I also want to add that both my friend and her husband seem to be addicted to video games and put those over their daughter's needs. An example would be how they refuse to get their daughter a new mattress. The one she is sleeping on is over 20 years old, saying that the cost was too high. You can get a single mattress for $1 to $200 at most, but a month later bought themselves a PS5 each, just over $1,400 for both. The daughter is definitely at the bottom of their priorities. And now in the comments, well, she openly admitted that she wished she never had her child. So if you take her in, there is a good chance it won't be just for a couple of months, more like 14 years. I can't tell you whether you should or not, because that is a personal choice. If you do decide to take her in, make sure they're paying you. Secondly, expect the little girl will be very sad to be away from her parents and will probably start acting out, so you need to be sure that you can handle that. Please update with what you decide. Your friend, at the very least, should also have a written plan and timeline for how she intends to get better, agreed to by everyone involved in the situation. She should be held accountable to this plan. 
I'm thinking identification of resources or help she intends to access while the child is with you. If she's hesitant to come up with any firm details, then she's intending to ditch the poor little one with you. You should carefully consider if you're capable of raising the girl before taking her in. Otherwise, they should look for other avenues for her. This is an awful situation, especially for the kid. I hope this resolves in her favor. I just want to add to this that Opie and husband should probably talk to a lawyer. Given the legally ambiguous nature of the arrangement, even with a written plan, there are a lot of potential pitfalls here that a lawyer's eyes need to identify and tackle, such as who will claim the child on their taxes? Will OP be able to make medical decisions for the child? And how are they authorized? Who has the legal custody of the child? Will it remain with the parents? If so, would they need to be consulted for everything? What if they don't respond or it's an urgent situation where contacting them isn't feasible? This 100%. It really sounds like you and your husband would be a lifesaver for this little girl, but you need to protect yourself as well. Get a lawyer. Hopefully familiar with the family laws in both provinces and work through your options. Good luck. I think the odds that OP and her husband fall in love with this little girl and decide they wish to adopt her will likely collide with some sort of short-lived, I want my kid back, bullcrap, that will return to neglect in no time is almost inevitable. This is a tough one. I think the question here is almost more one of, do they want permanent custody and putting that legally in place? Her parents sound immature and irresponsible. I'd expect them pinballing all over on this issue and effing up their kids and OP's life without a formal legal agreement. Also, if that happens, it's time for OP to stop being friends with these assholes. Your friend will never come back for her daughter. She's identified you as a soft touch and a safe house. So either adopt the kid legally or say no. Or worse, if nothing is legalized, she might come back in five years when she decides she's ready to be a mother. And that's why I think there's only two solutions, legal or no. A four-year-old might find it difficult to cope with being moved to a new family for a few months. If she's anything like mine, where she'll have a great time for a day or two and then want to see her mum and dad, she probably won't fully understand what's happening and why. After months, she will very likely feel that she's been abandoned by her parents. I appreciate that you want to give her a more stable environment, but I'm not sure that several months with you would be the best way to do that. It sounds like your friend would like you to adopt her daughter. If her child comes to stay for two months, be prepared for there to be all sorts of reasons why the stay needs to be extended. If you're open to adopting, start a serious discussion. If not, which would be reasonable and sensible, you probably don't want to agree to look after the child for months. And OP says, one of the scenarios that my husband and I have discussed is the real possibility that they keep finding excuses why their daughter has to stay here longer and it eventually turns into years instead of just months. My friends told me she does want her daughter back after her husband and her get better together in order to be better parents. I'm not so naive to believe that at all. I know my friends well enough to read between the lines. And now to update number two. After a lot of consideration and talking to my brother, social worker, works for CAS, my husband and I decided that we would not take the daughter, even for just a visit. It was a very difficult decision to make, and even now I'm not 100% certain it's the right one. We called my friend yesterday, made sure her husband joined in on the call, and we laid out all of our concerns, and told them both that while they are always welcome to visit as a family, we just can't take their daughter by herself. My friend was very upset. She actually walked away, as we were on FaceTime, we thought it best to talk face to face as best as we could, and she refused to come back to the phone for most of the conversation. Very immature, but I can't say it wasn't expected of her. We talked mostly to her husband, explained our reasons, as there's too many to get into here, and then told him that if they have things they need to work on, they need to work on them as a family unit. I was also very blunt, and told them that in no way would we be taking their daughter just for them to live like a child-free couple and spend all of their waking moments playing video games. When my friend did eventually come back to the call, I told her that she has a serious problem with video games and she needs to get her crap together not just for herself, but for her daughter. I might have been too harsh. I got pretty angry with her at one point, but when she tried to pull the no one else seems to care about my video game playing card, 
referencing the fact that our mutual friends just don't say anything to her about it, I reminded her that I have always been the friend to be honest with her and give her tough love. I told her that she and her husband need to get themselves into therapy and do better, as partners, as parents, and as people. When we hung up, after almost two hours of talking, I was hopeful that we got through to them, and they would start to get it together. This was all yesterday. Today, her sister sent me a message on Facebook to tell me that my friend's daughter will be visiting with her in about two weeks, for a month or so, to spend time with her kids during the summer, and asked if I wanted to plan something with the daughter for a week or two while she was there. I was stunned. My friend's sister, who I'll just call sister from now on, is a single mother with three kids of her own. I thought she was still in a two-bedroom apartment, but just found out she recently moved to a three-bedroom house. She posted about it on Facebook, but I honestly hardly go on there at all. I immediately called sister to tell her everything. Sister had no idea that my friend had approached me first about watching her daughter, and when I told sister about everything that happened and about the post on Reddit, I read some comments to her. She was pissed. She said that my friend framed it to her that she simply wanted her daughter and sister's kids to spend more time together so that she could know her cousins better, since they are so far apart. I warned sister about everything brought up on Reddit, and by the time we were done talking, she had decided not to have the daughter visit. She must have called my friend and told her all of this, because just about an hour ago, I got a screaming, angry phone call from my friend, telling me I was a horrible friend for doing what I did, and for not being there for her when she needed me. I said nothing. I was speechless. And after just a few minutes, she hung up on me. Now I'm sitting here sick with worry about her daughter, and unsure of what to do next. I think a call to CAS is needed, but beyond that, what do I do? Is there even anything else I can do? I'm lost, guys, and so scared for that little girl. Edit, I will be calling CAS tomorrow and reporting my friend with the help of my brother. I'm just not sure if there's anything else I can be doing on top of that. And now in the comments, Child Protective Services is absolutely an option here. If you have trouble getting in touch with the right organization, call the child's local law enforcement and they will direct you. Keep in mind that, if the child ends up getting seized, she may be placed in the foster care system, which isn't the ideal life for the child either. CPS and the associated legal system is there to make the determination though. They aren't going to seize a kid from a family unless they are confident that the foster care system will be an improvement for the child. There may be other family open to taking the child too. The only downside would be that it's going to burn any remaining bridges with your relationship with this friend. But it feels like that relationship is both damaged and toxic anyway. Another thought, if you aren't really confident about your assessment yet, you could offer to come visit for a week to help out. It would set up a situation where you have boundaries, can't dump the kid on you permanently, and give you an opportunity to further assess the situation. Sorry for this mess. Morally, I think there is a lot of justifiable options here, and the decision that it's not right for your family is one of many valid assessments. I know you want to do right by this child, but your family is also important. And, by the way, if you were to have gone the other way, and decided to foster this child for an indefinite amount of time without any legal agreements, you simply would have been used as an outpatient clinic for long-term childcare. The friends would still view the child as theirs, and it would have been a mess. You still would want to work through CPS, even if you did make that decision. I would try and make sure they don't try and pawn off their kid on someone else again. I'd talk to the sister, and ask her to warn other family members, and maybe they all figure something else. All I mean is, I don't want her to trick her friends or family members into taking this child, like she tried to do with her sister. People need to make informed decisions not to be tricked into it. I would also call child services, but that's all you can do. And OP says, Yes, I discussed contacting family and mutual friends with the sister. They have her husband's parents in the same city, but they are the only ones. My friend's parents aren't an option for her at all, as she doesn't speak to them. If you thought this was the end, it's not the end. This is still going. Update number four is titled, should I allow my friend to take her daughter for an overnight visit? 
To keep a long story short, I'll just say that for a few different reasons, my husband and I currently have temporary custody of my friend's four-year-old daughter. My friend and her husband gave her to us voluntarily, but there is also an official order in place that states that we have guardianship over her. Visitation is completely up to us. My friend and her husband live halfway across the country, so visits haven't happened at all yet. However, my friend will be going, without her husband, to visit her sister in a few weeks, who lives close by, within an hour drive. She said that she wants to bring her daughter for an overnight visit with her, but I don't know if I want to allow it. I have custody of her daughter for good reasons, and I'm not sure if it's a good idea. However, she will be at her sister's who has three children of her own, and I trust that her sister will take care of the daughter. I am also currently pregnant, in my first trimester, and it's kicking my butt. A break would be nice. I have a son that's the same age as a daughter. It's been fun so far, but also chaotic. The reason I'm uncomfortable with the idea is that I have this horrible fear, rational or irrational, that my friend could take off with her daughter and I would never see them again. In the past, my friend has talked about just packing up and leaving, with or without her daughter, and the nagging feeling of what she might do is making me hesitate. Thoughts? My husband said that we could offer to have my friend here for a few days, and that way I can monitor them. But I have a feeling she won't go for that. Am I being unreasonable for thinking I should let my friend have an overnight visit with her daughter? And now in the comments, I understand the need for a break, but if your instincts say no, then no, it is. As a father of two, I've always gone the safe route. I'd rather hurt someone's feelings once in a while than lose my kids. Trust your gut. Always trust your gut. Like you said, you have custody of this little girl for a reason. Do not let her out of your sight. If this woman wants to spend time with her daughter, have her come and spend time with her in your home with you there to supervise. Your friend's feelings and wants are inconsequential. All that matters is keeping that little girl safe. I think I have whiplash from all the sudden turns on this story. At least the turns are all normal and make sense. Well, at least OP doesn't come off like a raging moron like so many of these stories do. They seem to have a decent nose for when they are being manipulated at the very least but I'd really like a more in-depth explanation of how it went from I'm not taking the kid, sister isn't taking the kid, friend lost her crap, to so I have the kid for good reasons and I don't know if I want to let my friend see her. Like, I'm sorry, but what the hell changed? I'm pretty sure something heavy happened and she doesn't want to go into detail. Friend may have done something extreme, like abandoning the kid after no one would take her. Well, and there is a huge difference between a casual agreement between friends and taking in a state-funded foster child. Friend and husband are addicts, switch out video games for cocaine or alcohol, and it's apparent they have a terrible problem. It's such a shame society doesn't give the more harmless addictions as much attention as it does drugs. I've read too many horror stories of gym addicts, gaming addicts, energy drink addicts, etc. There are inpatient treatment programs for video game addictions, just like there are places for drug and eating disorders. The World Health Organization recognizes the addiction as real as the others. Addiction of any kind tears a family apart. I wonder if child services found them to be unfit as addicts and would place the child in foster care until her parents recovered. It's stories like this that makes me wish not having kids was the societal norm and there were an opt into instead of being assumed in a marriage and something you have to opt out of. There are a lot of people having kids because they think they have to instead of wanting to. And once the kid is here, they realized they hate being a parent, but the kid is here and they are stuck. And a bit of a bonus post, they put an Am I the Arsehole post in here, so I'm going to read that too. Am I the Arsehole for getting a dog without telling my landlord, who is also my brother-in-law? So my husband and I moved into this house five plus years ago and had two Great Danes at the time. Our landlord is my husband's sister's husband, brother-in-law, and has no problem with the dogs. About three years ago, both dogs passed away within the same year, and we decided not to get more pets for a while. However, a few months ago, we decided to adopt a lab mix from the local shelter. 
Our son really wanted a dog, and we felt that enough time had passed since our other dogs passed away that we would be okay to get another dog. He's the best dog, and my son adores him. Recently, we had to make some changes to the house to make room for another child to come and stay with us, and decided to move our office downstairs and convert the old office into a bedroom. Since our landlord is also our brother-in-law, he has allowed us to make aesthetic changes to the house, such as painting, carpet change, etc. While we were taking down wallpaper, we noticed an odd stain beneath one section that looked like it might be water damage, and called brother-in-law over to check it out in case it was something serious. He came over, and when he saw the dog, he made a comment like, Oh, you guys got a new dog? And I was a bit surprised because we hadn't kept it a secret. My husband had told his sister and mother, and brother-in-law's teenage daughter had visited our home since we got the dog. So we just assumed he knew. He checked out the stain, as it turned out to be nothing, and then left, and then the next day my husband got a text message from brother-in-law saying that it was wrong of us to not ask for permission before getting the dog. He wants us to get rid of it. I'm confused as to why he is upset. We came into this house with two giant dogs, and he never had an issue. We discussed animals in the house before moving in, and he said then that it wasn't a problem. There's nothing in our lease that prohibits animals. I refuse to get rid of this dog. Am I in the wrong here? And now in the comments, even though it's not banned, most landlords want to know about a new cat or dog due to the potential to damage the property. Sorry, but you're the asshole bordering everyone sucks here. You are lucky that your brother-in-law is your landlord and lets you get away with stuff a rando landlord may not. It is normal and courteous to notify a landlord of getting a new pet because it could cause damage to the property. Though it thankfully doesn't sound like your pup is. I think he's being a little unreasonable asking you to get rid of it. Especially because family ties usually give you a little wiggle room. Do you have a lease? What does it say? Without a lease, I think you're okay to keep the dog, but be careful you don't burn any cushy landlord bridges along the way. And OP says, I wouldn't talk to a rando landlord before getting a pet when I came into the house with two large dogs already, and our lease specifically states that animals of all kinds are permitted. This dog isn't a puppy, he is five and very well behaved. No messes, no damage. I would out of courtesy. But if your lease says you can have animals, then I guess you don't have to tell him or have to get rid of it. Thank goodness, because I would hate for that to happen. I think that part was really unreasonable of him. Hopefully he realizes that. And OP says, I think there might be something else going on in his life that's making him salty about this. His wife, my husband's sister, texted him and apologized for brother-in-law's text, and said she didn't understand why he was being like this. So who knows? So he will let you literally renovate the place without asking for his opinion, but get a small dog. As a Dane owner, yes, labs are small dogs, and he suddenly has a stick up his ass? Not the asshole. This is one of the reasons why I was surprised. We have changed so much in the time we have been here, and since we came in with two giant dogs, we didn't even stop and think to talk to him in first before getting this dog. And now back up to the post, there is an edit to update. Sister-in-law just called to talk to my husband. She apologized, told him that brother-in-law already knew about the dog months ago because she told him. She admitted to my husband that she and brother-in-law are getting a divorce, and that brother-in-law has just been angry that we are living in his property. Not just his, it's jointly owned. And he wants us out because my husband is sister-in-law's brother. He doesn't want to have to deal with any of her family. Looks like we might have bigger issues to worry about soon. My, 32 female, Girl Scout leader, 32 female, stole all of our cookie money. I am so furious, Reddit. I need some advice before I do something rash. I am a co-leader for a Girl Scout troop of first graders. I don't have a daughter or family member in the troop, but I was in Girl Scouts when I was a girl, and I thought it would be a great way to volunteer and give back. When an old Girl Scout member that used to be in my troop, Candy, posted about starting up the troop on Facebook, I jumped on board. It's our very first year as a troop, and we only have five girls. Despite our small number, and starting up halfway through the season, we still manage to raise $3,000 in cookie money. About a quarter of that goes to our troop to do fun activities with the girls. 
I myself raised about $800 of that. Everything was going great, and I was super excited to have a few fun end of the season events with the girls with the money that we raised. That is until I received a letter from the Girl Scout office that they tried to withdraw the money from our account. As leaders, we had to start a non-profit bank account under our troop number, and they were unsuccessful. If they didn't receive the money within the next five business days, we would be removed as volunteers and sent to third-party debt collectors. I immediately called Candice, and she acted very confused and said she didn't know why they sent me anything, considering she's the primary leader and I'm the co-leader, and that she would go to the bank and update me later. Well, the day came and went, and I received no update from her. So the following day, I went to the bank to ask them to print out a statement for me. She's listed as the primary person on the account, so I don't get anything from the bank in the mail. It turns out someone, well, obviously her, had been withdrawing money in the bank over the last month. $50 one day, $200 the next, $400 the next day, and so on until the bank only had $3 remaining. Then the Girl Scouts attempted to withdraw the money, and it became overdrawn, and we now have a negative 33 balance from the charges from the bank. So then I called Candice to ask her what was going on, and she just brushed it off like it was no big deal, and told me she could account for 800 of it in supplies that she got for the troop. What supplies? And then just started changing the subject to something else. I then became really worried that Candice would try to throw me under the bus to the Girl Scouts, so when I went back to the bank and sat down with the branch manager to get some evidence that she had been withdrawing the money, it turns out Candice did come into the bank and contest the charges when she told me she would investigate it. But the bank manager explained to her that when you withdraw directly through the bank, not the ATM, you have to provide an ID and he had a teller in the bank that specifically remembered her coming in. When the branch manager left Candice in his office to go retrieve some proof for her, she bolted and left the bank. I was shocked, but the branch manager happily provided me with signed withdrawal slips from Candice in case I needed to relay them to the Girl Scouts organization. I have since spoken with the Girl Scouts organization, and they have assured me that Candice will be the one sent to the debt collectors and not me. I'm relieved to hear that, but Candace has no idea that I know all of this. She actually just texted me to see if I would run the meeting tomorrow because she's busy with work. Yeah, right. At the same time, I'm worried that she won't tell any of the parents what's going on. What if she scams them out of more money? Should I text her and tell her that I know what she did? Or should I just ghost her? I just wanted to volunteer. Now in the comments, Girl Scout Mum here, this happens all the time. You need to push on your local organization hard. They should have a policy or you can start mentioning that you were thinking about calling the press. This usually can make the TV news. Usually what to do is to call the police and report it as embezzlement. If your co-leader isn't poor, they can get away with it if they pay it back ASAP. However, even if the leader can't pay it back, the kids in the troop are screwed. There is no national policy on this very, very common issue, except for that the Girl Scouts don't help out financially. This is why it is a huge issue. Those little girls got their work invalidated and their money stolen. Public outrage after a TV story will usually get them some donations in order to have something of a troop. I hadn't realized that this is a common issue. Who would do that to little kids? I hope OP goes to the police with this. It's not fair at all. Con artists usually don't consider the age, sex, finances, etc. of their victims. They just want money however they can get it. It's still disgusting though. I'm a CPA, and one of the things they teach in ethics courses is that most big dollar fraud and theft occurs by the older people that have been there forever and are well trusted. While young people do petty crime like stealing five bucks out of the register, grandma steals the entire retirement fund or embezzles a million dollars because no one is watching her. OP says, I just called the Girl Scouts and they didn't have much information for me on what to do. It's really frustrating. I'm just trying to do the right thing. You would think they would have better policies in place for this kind of thing. I've been a parent in scouting for decades. Listen, do not lie or withhold info from the parents. By pretending that you know nothing or minimizing what you do know, you are participating in a cover-up. You have done nothing wrong. Don't start now by lying. You are a victim too. 
It's time to get aggressive with your local council. Tell them that if they won't provide someone to speak to all of you regarding this theft at the next meeting, you will clearly outline everything you know about this for the parents, and then you will file a police report for theft. Do not allow this organization to let your name get dragged through this muck. Lying to parents about this is the worst way to get dirty. Believe me, the gossip among scouting parents will filter through the community and hurt you and your business. Don't let the council throw you under the bus like this. Back up to the post, we have an edit that says, I just went to the bank to see if she had replaced the money. She obviously did not, and the Girl Scouts attempted to withdraw the cookie money again a few days ago. There is another overdraft fee, and now the account is at negative $69. Giggity. I then called our local Girl Scouts organization, and they informed me that they are still processing this issue, so they haven't definitively taken her off the volunteer roll just yet. But I should be getting an update from them later today, or tomorrow. They told me that I should go to the meeting tomorrow and not to give the parents any details, and if I have to say anything, just be as vague as possible. I'm kind of worried about this because I have a small business in town that my name is attached to, and I don't want my name to get dragged through the mud. Also, I guess that means that I have to respond to Candace's text that I will do the meeting? I don't really want to talk to her, so I'm not sure what I should do. I will update soon when I hear more from the Girl Scouts. Edit 2, I received a phone call from our troop support specialist, and she has communicated with Candy to drop off the box of troop items for the meeting on my porch. Candy told them that she will be dropping it off in a half hour. I hope she doesn't knock on my door and try to talk with me. I will totally lose my damn mind on her. The troop specialist is going to call me back tonight to tell me the verbiage I should use with the parents, but I feel kind of slimy about the wording that she used. She said, right now, only you and Candy know the money was taken. That's all I'm saying. Like, what is that supposed to mean? I'm not supposed to say anything to the parents because they don't have access to the account? And now on to the update. So it's been just about a month and I have an update for all of you. Thank you so much to everyone who offered advice and their stories, it really helped. Most of you urged me to go to the police and file a report. Well, I did, but the officer that talked with me said I shouldn't file a police report yet and should contact Candy and try to procure the money from her to show that when I do file a police report, I can show them that I made every attempt to get it from her and that she is aware of the theft. So I messaged her. Candy, in the month of March, our Girl Scouts bank account was drained. I went to the bank and have account statements and withdrawal slips showing that you made unauthorized withdrawals from the account. If you do not restore the account, I will be filing a police report on June 1st to protect myself and the girls. Her response was, I will be restoring it, no worries. It was not all me, but I will be replacing it because I'm the one who lost the information. But thank you. I am putting in a certain amount each month towards both Girl Scouts and the bank. But thank you. I got what you were saying. My response was, I spoke with a branch manager at the bank. They have evidence that it was you. I have had a bank account there for over a decade. They require you to show proper ID when you withdraw money from the account. Also, there are cameras outside and inside the building. Candy's response, Well, without going into my personal information, I do not remember it, but I am being treated for it. Acknowledged my mistake and will take care of it. It will all be paid to the GS Council before August 1st, and the remainder of the money is accounted for between my trip to the council shop and the stuff I will be purchasing for the water park. My first payment to them is June 1st, because that is my first check for the new job. That is all I'm saying on any of this. After that, I talked with the GS Council again and sent them the messages. I told them if they wouldn't resolve this, I would. They had a meeting about it the next day and decided to remove Candy as a volunteer, obviously, and that they would be going after her for the full amount of what they owe the Girl Scouts and what she stole from our troop. They also agreed to deposit the money right back into our account as soon as she was removed from the bank account. I was super happy about this resolution. There is a catch though. They didn't want me to tell the parents at our last meeting that this was going on. They had to officially send Candy a letter of removal before it was official. Also, my contact at the GS Council said they still wanted me to pass out flyers for Candy's water park event that she promised. I was pissed about that because this lady might have a drug problem or something. 
How in the hell can you trust that she will go buy anything for the water park or even show up? And if she does, what if she uses it as an opportunity to scam them out of more money? They had Candy drop off the troop meeting information on my porch, so I didn't have to talk to her. Well, I went to the meeting and no one ended up turning up because Candy had conveniently scheduled it the day before they had the day off of school, which I wasn't aware of since I don't have a child in the school. So no one thought there was a meeting. I was actually really happy about that because I didn't want to encourage them to go to this supposed water park event hosted by Criminal Candy. After that, the Girl Scout Council agreed to send a representative to have a meeting with the parents and go over our options for next year and having a new troop leader. Candy sent me a message this morning. I guess one of the parents clued her in about our meeting, saying, the only thing that needs to be discussed at tonight's meeting is the fact that I will not be returning as troop leader for Troop X. My family is moving and will no longer be in the school district or nearby to be able to continue with the truth. I wish you the best of luck. Yes, screw her for trying to cover her own ass. Even though I would love to tell everyone how terrible she is, I decided not to tell the parents about Candy. I thought about it a lot and if I did, one of the parents will tell their daughter and then everyone will be gossing about Candy's daughter. It is not this poor girl's fault that her stepmom is a crook and I don't want her to get bullied because of it. I also think it would turn a lot of the parents away from the troop and I don't want to ruin everyone's Girl Scout experience because of me. Candy is gone and can't be a part of the troop anymore, so good riddance. Girl Scouts are going after her for all the money, so she will have to face the legal consequences as well. Me telling the parents wouldn't help with anything. Also, on a positive note, at the meeting, one of the parents said they will step up and be troop leader. Yay! I have decided to stay on and help them as much as possible. I want to have a good experience volunteering, and I shouldn't give up because of one jerk. And edit, just wanted to add to those that are worried that Candy can do this to another troop, she has been blacklisted from the Girl Scouts organization nationally. She is not allowed to be in any leadership role. As far as her doing something shady somewhere else otherwise, there is not a whole lot I can do about that. I can't let everyone in my state know that she is a scumbag. So it is what it is. Now in the comments, you should probably tell the council that Candy is going to be skipping town. And OP replies, she emailed that to me and CC'd my contact at the council, so they know. She is really terrible at being a criminal. This is a great update. You've acted like a fantastic role model, and even though the kids and parents won't know about this incident, I'm sure that they'll get so much out of what you can teach them. I was in Girl Scouts as a kid, and it really made a difference when we had a leader who really cared about the troop. Thank you for sticking it out for another year. Congrats on the new leader situation, and best wishes towards another year of campfires and cookies. Eat a sleeve of trefoils for me. So did I interpret that correctly? Is Candy suggesting she has some sort of condition that caused her to forget each time she went to the bank and stole money from children? Really? But it is good that you didn't tell the parents or that it isn't on the news. When I was in high school, the treasurer for the band boosters stole nearly $40,000 from the savings account. His daughter was definitely treated differently by the other students. Her dad was made fun of, people made assumptions about drugs or other things he may have been into to lead him to steal the money, things that she had, people would ask if the band boosters bought it for her, etc. Just getting harassed by other students for something that she didn't do and didn't know about. And I'm not sure if younger kids or teenagers would treat someone worse if their parent was caught stealing something from an organization that they volunteer for, to be honest. So even though it would be super tempting to show people Candy's true colors, I'm sure you spared her stepdaughter a lot of anguish. It's the shaggy defense. It wasn't me. Well, I don't remember doing that. Plausible deniability, evil twin. Whatever distracts people long enough to run away and start the next con. I'm amazed at the balls on this woman to admit her crime via text and not even be apologetic about it. She is her own defense attorney's worst nightmare. So the Girl Scouts are going after Candy now? Will the cops be involved? I don't know what's more frustrating, the Girl Scouts covering this up or Candy's total lack of remorse. And OP says, the Girl Scouts are going after Candy now legally. I don't know if they are bringing criminal charges against her or not. I know that they are for sure going after the money that she owes. 
so at a minimum, she will have to pony up what she's stolen. Also, because they are dealing with legal issues, I don't really think it's a cover-up, more of a legal thing. They can't go around talking crap about Candy if they plan to go after her legally. It could bite them in the ass. Also, they don't want to ruin the Girl Scouts for the other girls, which to me is totally understandable. Our next post is titled, Would I be the asshole for calling the police on my boyfriend after he let his brother and his family live in my holiday home without my permission? For context, I, 28 female, inherited a holiday home from my grandma some time ago. I never really use it, as it's roughly a five hour drive out from London, where I live. It's relevant to the story that the keys to the holiday home are on a rack, with literally every other key to anything my boyfriend or I own. The holiday house has a security system hooked up to my phone. When it detects someone on the property, cameras turn on and I can see them. My boyfriend's brother, 33 male, recently had his fourth child. Him and his wife are currently living in a two-bedroom apartment. So three days ago, they were both over at mine and my boyfriend's house with all their kids. We were talking about anything and everything. I was holding the baby. My boyfriend's brother eventually mentioned how I have my holiday home and how it has more than enough space for him and his wife to raise their four kids. My exact response was, yeah, but I'm not gonna let you live there, so... He went quiet after that, and his wife started to collect their kids and their things. They left about 10 minutes after. My boyfriend hasn't said anything to me about the conversation, yet I'm feeling bad about my response because I know they really do need the space. So fast forward to yesterday. I wake up for work and realize my boyfriend isn't in bed with me. Nothing out of the ordinary. He works from 8.30 a.m., when I finally am about to walk out to the door, I go to grab my keys and notice my holiday home's keys are gone. I look around for them and can't find them, so I call my boyfriend. First time he doesn't answer, second time he doesn't answer, third time he does. The conversation went, hey, have you seen my other house's keys? And he says, yes, I have them. So I say, cool, why have you got them though? Oh, I grabbed them by accident. I'll return them when I'm back from work. I thought everything would be fine, so I continued with my day and went on to work. Midway through my workday, I get a notification from the house's security system. I open it and find my boyfriend, his brother, and his family all outside the door with a moving van in the back. I was fuming. When I got home, my boyfriend was already there, acting as if everything was normal. I started screaming at him, asking him why the hell he'd move a family into my house without my permission. He tried to justify it and say that he had to help his family. It honestly just made me more angry. I told him that we were over, and he has one day to get his brother and his family out of my house, or I would call the police on them all for trespass. That all happened at around 6 yesterday, 14 hours ago. He hasn't called me or anything, but I fully intend to go through with my threat. But I know they are struggling right now. So, would I be the asshole for calling the police? And now in the comments, not the asshole. Call the police now. Do not procrastinate out of confusion and misplaced kindness any longer. This is a bad situation, and the longer you delay addressing it, the more complex and difficult it will become. These are people who made conscious choices to deceive you and steal from you. You cannot trust them to behave reasonably or predictably. You need to get them out of your property. Have the locks changed and pursue whatever legal action is available to you to ensure that they are sufficiently cowed to be unlikely to risk doing something this foolish again. This. I'm not sure how squatting rights work in the UK, but the less time they have there, the better. I would have driven right down there and started throwing their crap out on the lawn. Not the asshole. Sorry, but for all the people saying that OP is making kids homeless, A, it wasn't their house to suddenly move into to begin with, and B, it's not the OP's responsibility to provide shelter. The parents are the ones responsible, and they are essentially squatting. It was not the boyfriend's gift to decide what happens to that house. It takes time to box things up and plan a move, so it is possible boyfriend and family must have been planning this for some time behind OP's back. Will they be paying for the rent and bills? Has any of that been considered? Or were they planning to have OP foot the bill? I'd call the police OP. 
I'd bet that the overwhelming majority of people who claim OP is making kids homeless are not housing homeless and or orphaned kids themselves. 100% this. Probably also not offering to take in orphans or foster kids, or purchasing properties with the sole intention of providing a home to a family in need. OP's only responsibility is to her property. If any of those children or their parents were to become hurt on her property, she could be held liable, even though she did not give them permission to be on her property. There are reasons that trespassing laws exist. I only know just enough about landlord liability laws to save my own ass from a point in time where I had to rent out empty bedrooms in my home to keep myself afloat. Ended up accidentally renting a room to a raging alcoholic who was a danger to himself and everyone else in the house. He came with glowing recommendations from the best roommate that I ever had. I had to evict him, because if he even so much as fell down the stairs and broke a leg, I would be on the hook for his medical bills, and I could not even pay for my own medicine at that point in time. And yeah, I felt bad because it was Christmas, but my only responsibility was to myself and my property. Opie needs to take care of herself, her property, and her finances. And these leeches who thought that they could get around her boundaries can sod all the way off. And now on to the update, edit. Thanks for all the advice. By searching through the UK's government website, I've managed to figure out what I can legally do. I've also called the police on them already. I haven't received any updates on that yet, but I'll share them when I can. Edit 2. I called the police a small while ago. About 30 minutes ago, they came and returned my keys and let me know that the family had been told to leave by them. At first, they refused, but eventually they packed their things up and went. My ex-boyfriend, his brother, and his brother's wife have been blowing up my phone, asking why the hell I'd put them and their children through this. I have blocked them all. I feel absolutely terrible about what I did, and I know there was probably better ways to handle the situation. I even considered letting them stay after all, but I'm not sure if they would pay rent or anything. For the future, I plan to rent the home out, as many of you suggested, but I'm not sure how ex-boyfriend's family would take that. And now in the comments, who cares? It's none of their business. Exactly. Anyway, the brother and his family had no intention of paying rent, so it doesn't matter. Family living there free isn't a comparison to a paying tenant. OP is in the right. If he went behind her back on this, he probably has a list of other things that he has done that she doesn't know about yet. What strikes me is that the first time the subject of them living there was ever broached was two days before they moved in, and it was brought up, seemingly, as a way of hoping to get permission before doing a move that they were already packing for. This tells us that the boyfriend either knew she would say no, or knew they wouldn't be paying rent. Both of those are just terrible obligations to try to put on another person. The boyfriend also knew that this would end up being discovered eventually, and simply did not care about the consequences. That is straight up malicious. It can be so hard to remove squatters from the UK that when a friend of a friend moved into their new rental and there was a squatter living there, the landlord told them they'd just have to live with the squatter. This could have been a whole lot more painful for OP. Yeah, I think they figured they'd move in and she wouldn't know, and so by the time she figured it out, they would have established squatter's rights and she wouldn't be able to get them out legally. They didn't count on her having that camera and alarms. I bet you, had the boyfriend known, he would have disabled them. Holy crap, that is absolutely insane. I can't imagine the landlord not having the right to kick someone out with proper notice. In the US, if they are squatting, you can have them evicted within 60 days, depending on which state you're in. I also immediately started to come up with all sorts of devious and nasty things I would do if I were the people moving in with that squatter. I have a penchant for really stinky cheese, and I also don't mind some pretty abrasive music. I have a feeling that I could make that person's life a living hell, while also not giving them any rights to call the police about it. Am I the asshole for telling my friend her boyfriend is not allowed at my wedding? I'm supposed to be getting married early October 2022. It's not going to be a big wedding or anything, but me and my fiancé both have friends that we don't want to leave out. I have this friend, Amanda. We have known each other since high school, and we aren't incredibly close by any means, but we are still somewhat good friends and hang out regularly, and I would like her to be there. 
The problem is, I just recently found out who she is now dating, and she wants to bring him as her plus one. My sister Lily and her ex Steve broke up about 10 months ago because she found out he was cheating. She was heartbroken, and I know along with that pain, she still has a lot of resentment for him and doesn't even like hearing his name. He was a crap boyfriend, so my family has no problem with him no longer being in our lives. Eight months ago, Amanda told me she had started talking to someone and she really liked him and everything. She wouldn't tell me who, not even his name, because she said she didn't want to share anything about him until it got more serious. I didn't really understand the secrecy, but didn't force her to tell me anything and just let her know that I was happy for her and I hoped it all worked out. Well, last week, she told me she was dating Steve. They had gotten more serious and she wanted to make their relationship public to the people they care about. She also said she knew how much I disliked him and what he had done to my sister and hoped that I would try to understand their love and be happy for her and try to see him in a different light. I was a little shocked at first, since I really didn't expect her to be with a guy like him and she knew what kind of person and boyfriend he was. But it isn't my place, and I told her that I'm happy that she's happy, and that was that. Well, two days later, we are texting about the wedding and everything, and she mentions Steve being her plus one. I do not want him there. Not only because I know my sister, who's my maid of honor, doesn't want him there, but also because I don't like him, and neither does my fiance. I immediately told her that Steve was not invited to the wedding. She was confused, and I explained to her that I was sorry, and I'm happy for her, but I didn't want him there. At first, she thought it was just because my sister would be, and kept saying that they wouldn't even be near each other, and it would be fine. But then I explained that with everything that happened, we didn't want him there. I said sorry again, but she kept saying how I don't want her to be happy, how I just want to live in the past, how I want to punish her for finding love, stuff like that. None of that is true, and I tried to tell her that, but she stopped responding. So now I'm feeling like a complete asshole, and I don't know if I should just let Steve come or not. Now in the comments, not the asshole. Why in the F should you allow someone at your wedding who caused you and your family pain? For someone you describe as a somewhat good friend? Her trying to make this about her, yep, the only reason you don't want the cheating ex at your wedding is because you want to punish her for finding love, yep, tells me that you need a new friend. Not the asshole. It's your wedding. Ultimately, you can decide who gets to be there, let alone having a pretty fair reason why you don't want him there. No brainer. Your friend should have some understanding and lay off this or don't come to be honest. Also, I wouldn't want some trash appearing in some of my wedding photos. I don't pay the wedding tax on a photographer just to get photos I never want to look back upon. So there's that too. I would bet money that she and misunderstood Steve started dating more than eight months ago. Nevertheless, why would you host and feed an asshole who cheated on your maid of honor and treated her badly? She's kind of insane. Not the asshole. You choose who is allowed at your wedding. You want it to be a positive experience, and having that crap head there would bring down the vibe big time. Your friend also needs a reality check, frankly. Edit slash update. First of all, I want to thank everyone so much for commenting and giving judgment. I know I haven't replied to everyone, but I tried to give any extra information that was asked for or relevant, though I'm sorry if I didn't reply to you. Now, as I have mentioned in the comments, I had a lapse in my judgment, and that is what led to this post. I thought maybe I was seeing things simply from my distaste for Steve, and it was coming off as I wasn't supportive of Amanda, and that's what made me think I was wrong for not allowing him to come. But I see now, I am completely in the right to not have or want him there, so he will not be invited and that won't be changing. With Amanda, I have pretty much decided that she is no longer invited to my wedding, and I'm pretty sure I'm ending the friendship. But I wanted to sit down with her and have a conversation first. Not to salvage anything, but I have some things to say to her and questions to ask. With the cheating, I mentioned in the comments that we only know of three girls that Steve cheated with. We all believe there are more, especially since one of the affairs goes all the way back to a year. They were together for two, but we don't know for sure, and have no solid evidence at the moment, and Lily doesn't care to find any. Amanda could very well be one of the unknown affair partners. 
It's very likely, and the timing and secrecy makes more sense to believe she was. Even though I intend to end this friendship, and I'm finding it hard to believe that Steve wasn't cheating with her, it still would suck if she had been. Another thing that I mentioned in the comments was that Amanda had offered support to my sister when everything happened. She even said more than once that Steve was an asshole for hurting Lily, and for that to have most likely been an act would suck. I would also like to clear up something about Amanda and her wanting to make their relationship public. Right after she told me they were dating, she started posting them on social media and telling people, so my wedding wouldn't really be their coming out event. Though it would definitely be a way for them to show off their relationship and gloat and everything. Still not okay, but just wanted to clear it up and not mislead anyone. Last thing, I was finally able to get a response out of Amanda. I told her I would like to talk to her about everything and get everything out in the open, and she has agreed to meet with me and talk. So, I shall update when that happens. And now, on to that update. I wasn't sure if it would be better to post an update here or to make a separate post, so I hope posting here is okay. Also, sorry for the wait. I was finally able to sit down with Amanda and talk today. Anyways, on to what happened. I didn't really want Amanda coming to my house, so we met at this small cafe place near where we live. I figured it wouldn't be too crowded and we would be able to have a discussion easily there, so it was the best option. She was there first, and as soon as I sat down, she looked extremely smug. It seems that she thought that I had wanted to talk to apologize or something, and thought that I would be telling her Steve was invited to the wedding. Imagine her surprise when I almost immediately told her that Steve is in no way allowed to attend, and I have officially decided to rescind her invite as well. She was instantly angry, asking why would I do that when I was obviously in the wrong? Why would I uninvite her simply because she wanted her partner there, etc? Bullcrap like that. I let her rant for a minute before I calmly told her what I wanted to say. I told her that my family, and literally everyone important to me that would be at the wedding, did not like Steve. No one but her wanted him there, and multiple people would be uncomfortable if he was. I also told her it was my wedding, and me and my fiancé are the only two people who gets to decide who comes and who doesn't. I was clear that she was allowed to want her boyfriend there, but I wasn't obligated to cater to her once, especially when that is someone I don't like at all. I even told her that if she had just decided not to come at first, since he couldn't, I would have understood. But she tried to guilt trip me into inviting someone who wasn't wanted, so that is why she was no longer wanted. I told her how her actions made me feel and how I now perceived her, and made it clear that I wanted to end our friendship and stop our contact. She was furious through every word. Before I ended the conversation, I told her that I had a question and I wanted the complete truth. Honestly, wasn't sure if I would get it though, and I asked her point blank. Was she with Steve before he and Lily split? She got nervous wouldn't even make eye contact, and stayed silent for a few seconds. I figured that told me what I wanted to know, but I honestly wanted to hear her say it, and then she did. She told me that they had been together for a year total. They started sleeping together when Steve and Lily got into an argument, and Amanda started falling for him, so thought being his mistress was better than not having him at all. At first, he would only go to her when Lily and Tim fought, but then he started going to her whenever Lily was busy or his other girls were. She didn't feel sorry about it at all, and kept trying to justify her actions. She even tried to justify her ability to look my sister in the eyes, to comfort her. All of that, even though she was sleeping with Steve for so long. She really thinks she did the right thing just because she loves him. At one point, she said that they really were in love, and that she was the only one in his life now. I felt bad for her then, I admit, but that is not my problem. I got up, I walked out, and I drove straight to my sister's, where I am now. I told her what I had learned, and we're having a very fun girls' night with ice cream, alcohol, and movies. Amanda and Steve are no longer my concern, and I've decided to enjoy this stress-free time while I've got it, because I know I'm going to be stressed the closer the wedding day gets. Thank you to everyone who commented. You were all right about the cheating and everything, and I am extremely thankful for y'all opening my eyes. And now in the comments, 
It's okay because he loves me and he's only sleeping with me now. Yep, that's how that works. I had an Amanda in my life, though we weren't close. There was a guy that I was sleeping with that did not want to commit. He got acquainted with my Amanda via a group Facebook chat. Me and my Steve were still sort of hooking up, but I wanted to distance myself because, well, he was being a jerk. Two weeks later, my Amanda comes to me telling me she and my Steve were in love and demanded that I be happy for her. I already had my suspicions of those two for a while now, hence why I was distancing myself from Steve. But the demands and the callouts from my Amanda were just what the hellish levels. Be happy for her. Be proud for her. I should understand their love, and I have no say since I was never a girlfriend. Girl, he was still flirting with me three days ago. When I didn't respond to her for internalizing everything, she went on a rant on how I was unfair and a bitter hag. I'm older, and she blocked me on everything. I never reached out to her or the guy after that. I was just so flabbergasted. And the same time, good riddance on losing two people that just treated me like crap. I feel like Amanda needed Steve to come so badly, so she could show all the guests and herself that what they did wasn't that bad. I feel it was more to gloat. Look, he picked me. My sister and I have a complicated relationship, but I'd like to think that she wouldn't entertain inviting someone who broke my heart to her wedding. That's not even going into Amanda screwing Lily's ex on the down low and comforting her while she was heartbroken. Agreed. This would have been the line in the sand for me. Amanda is too bold for even thinking that OP would not be upset with her for this. It's sociopathic, like she got glee over seeing her upset. Lamal, people who are knowingly homewreckers are so funny to me. Yes, we're ruining homes and breaking the hearts of not just his significant other, but also the people around us, but it's true love. I'm somehow better than his awful, boring significant other. No, honey, you're the side piece of the day. Our next post is titled, A guy drove off with my couch while I was moving in, because if it's on the street corner, it's public property. So I just moved, Nevada, and it was just me and a couple of friends unloading. So we left some things on the street next to the moving truck while we did heavier items like desks, shelves, etc. as a team. I came out after bringing in some more boxes. Had been gone roughly 15 minutes to find a guy had loaded my couch into the bed of his truck. I ran up to him and explained that I own the couch. He said since it was on the street corner, it's public property, and he's within his rights to take it. He drove off before I could block his car. I did get his license plate and went to the police to make a report, but they asked me if it was in fact on the curb, and I said it was. But it was also pretty obviously next to a moving truck. It was wrapped up and surrounded by boxes, and I told him it was mine and I was moving. But the police didn't say anything that inspired hope. The couch has been in the family for three generations now, and while it probably isn't worth more than a few hundred bucks, it is sentimentally priceless. Is there anything I can do or further ways to escalate this to get my couch back? Thanks all. And now in the comments, make the report, keep pestering the cops. Yes, it is theft. Escalate within the PD. Abandoned property is one thing, but the circumstances here clearly indicate that it's not abandoned. And OP says, awesome, thank you. So it isn't actually going to hold firm that if it's on the corner, it's public property, because I know trash if public property, but this clearly wasn't trash. Abandoned property relies in part on the circumstances on which it's found. In a black trash bag on the corner? Yeah, that's abandoned. On the street corner with a sign saying free? Yeah, that's abandoned next to a moving truck with a lot of other items from and in the truck while people are moving things in. No, that's not abandoned. This guy is just trying to make a legal justification for his theft. Outside of filing a police report and providing the information, such as a description of the driver, the license plate, and description of the vehicle, the only other avenue I can think of is hiring a PI to go look for the guy, but that is going to be prohibitively expensive. And OP asks, how expensive? I am literally delaying my parents' visit out here because I do not know how to explain that we no longer have this couch. I'd be willing to go pretty deep to get it back. 
you would have to hire a PI to track the couch down, confirm its whereabouts, convince police to take action, and then potentially hire a lawyer or sue this person in small claims court. So probably three months at the earliest, plus thousands of dollars in expenses. And OP says, oh, yeah, I don't have the funds for that. If I did, I'd be seriously considering this though. Thanks for the help. Check on the local Facebook marketplace and Craigslist to see if it pops up in the meantime. They are pretty active in the Vegas area. And now on to the update. Thank you to the user who suggested I look in the Facebook marketplace. I found it there and I got the name of the man who took it. I took that information to the police and the man had other complaints of petty theft against him. Even better, one of the people who helped me move realized my neighbor has a video doorbell and I was able to get proof to the cops that the man stole my couch with me standing right there with a moving truck and boxes. A friendly officer went to his house and got my couch back, as well as a few other stolen outdoor furniture pieces. One was a bench from a local restaurant. I don't know the other situations. I deeply appreciate your legal advice. I now won't have to tell my parents the beloved multi-generational couch is gone. Cheers. And now in the comments. Wow, someone told them finders keepers as a kid and they took it to heart. My god, those asshole kids turn into asshole adults. People don't grow up, they just grow older. Some people have a nerve. I'm glad OP got his multi-generational couch back. I'm shocked but not shocked at the first set of cops and their lack of common sense. If it's next to a moving truck, you can't just go pick it up. The nerve of them too. It's not a lack of common sense, it's a lack of fucks. Cops who don't want to do anything can just come up with whatever bullcrap they want in order to justify doing no work. I had a cop tell me straight up that he hoped I wouldn't do what I was legally allowed to do because that would mean a lot more paperwork for him. All I could think of was why would that be my problem? It's their job, FFS. They sign up for it. It's not like anyone is forcing them. Many of the cops in my state make six figures and refuse to do anything but beat people up randomly or shoot them. They aren't just lazy, they are cruel and it's absolutely intentional. That's why they force good cops out. I am in no way surprised that OP only got their couch back because they did all of the cops work for them. What a trash human you have to be to live like that, cruising in your truck for people you can rob on a technicality. It's not even a technicality. Furniture being outside does not make it public property, and those cops are shitty AF for not even trying to find and contact the men who stole the couch. We should not be expected to track down our stolen property in order to recover it. I know many things get stolen, and it's hard for the cops to follow through on every case, but all they had to do was run the guy's plates and see if they could find a name and address to go to. Would I be the asshole for choosing my pet spider over moving in with my boyfriend? So I'm 25 male, my boyfriend is 27 male. We've been dating for two years and we're thinking of moving in together. The issue that we are having is centered on Agnes, my pet tarantula. I've had Agnes for five years now. I know she's not your typical pet, but I've always loved bugs and she was a gift from my parents. She's adorable and friendly in pet spider terms. I can hold her and she is very docile with me. My boyfriend knows about her and has seen her. He told me he thought it was strange, but I'm used to it. I know not everyone and their uncle has a pet tarantula. My rent has been climbing in my complex and this year I can't afford the increase. My lease is up in three months and my boyfriend bought his own house last year. So the topic of me moving in with him has come up. Apartments are really expensive right now and the cheap ones are COVID deals where the rent would increase exponentially within six months to a year. My boyfriend says I'm totally welcome to move in with him, but only if I ditch Agnes. I know it's stupid, but I don't want to part with her. She was there for me when I was alone. My boyfriend says it's not like she's an actual pet, like a cat or a dog, and it's kind of weird that I'm so attached to a spider. He doesn't want Agnes in his house and is pissed that I'm choosing Agnes over him. Would I be the asshole for choosing my spider over my boyfriend? Edit to add, y'all are getting your panties in a twist over my comment about how she was all I had. Please stop DMing me that I'm insane. When COVID first started, I was working from home. 
My complex has a no pet policy. I couldn't see my family or my friends, so it was largely just me and my spider. And now in the comments, not the asshole. Asking a partner to ditch a pet they love and are attached to is not reasonable. Him not seeing a spider as a proper pet is a him problem. Also, Agnes is the cutest name for a tarantula. Heck, I have some intense arachnophobia and I would let my partner move in with a tarantula. As long as she's not in the bedroom, I will admit. You were not choosing Agnes over him, you were being a responsible pet parent. If he decides to put an ultimatum, then he can't complain if things don't go his way. It's so weird. I hate spiders, but tarantulas are perfectly fine. I've held them and give them little pets because they are fuzzy. But a normal spider that you'd find in a house or garden? Nope. Out the window it goes via my husband because I'm on the other side of the house until it's gone. I'd be absolutely fine with a pet tarantula though. Not the asshole. My boyfriend says it's not like she's an actual pet. Nope, 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 nope. She's not his idea of a normal pet. That doesn't make her and you any less of a package deal. And the fact that he's framing things like this should have you questioning what other needs of yours he's prepared to dismiss by saying that's not valid when what he really means is, that's not what I want. Ditch this whole moving in together plan. Strongly consider ditching the boyfriend. At the very least, I would not leave him and Agnes alone together going forward, since he's made it clear he doesn't think her well-being is worth protecting if it gets in the way of the relationship. And find a roomie who is cool with Agnes. Not the asshole for not wanting to give up your pet. With that said, he said you are welcome to move in with him, with a stipulation of Agnes can't come with. You choose Agnes, so it's a done deal. Get looking at more apartments because you cannot force him to let you bring Agnes, just as he can't force you not to keep her. Also, now you have some thinking to do. Tarantulas have a fairly long lifespan. Since you know he doesn't want one in his house at all, you have to look at the bigger picture. Agnes will be around for another decade or so. That's a long time to be dating someone and not live together. There are spider lovers out there who wouldn't mind having both you and Agnes around. Perhaps this will be your time to start completely new with an apartment and future partner. And now back up to the post, there's an update. We'll add pet tax when I get home from work. Edit to add two. I know I said I would post spider tax, but I came home from work and Agnes isn't around. Her cage is closed like it was, so I'm just trying to find her. I'm busy, but we'll add spider tax later once I find out where she is. I'm a little paranoid right now because of comments, so I just want to spot her. And update, no spider tax. My now ex-boyfriend killed Agnes. She's gone. Thank you for all the kind words and everyone who shared their spider stories. He let her out and squished her while I was at work, or something along those lines. Hug your critters for me, please. And a relevant comment from OP, I broke up with him, I'm single now. I don't know what happened. He's telling me she escaped and was aggressive with him, so he squished her. She's not big enough to lift the top of her cage. It is physically impossible. I'm just kind of a mess right now, honestly. I'm just gonna have a drink and lay here, to be honest. And now in the comments, oh my god, that's such a horrifying update. I know spiders aren't considered a typical pet, but OP had Agnes for five years, and his ex knew how much she mattered to him, and he still killed her. If he's willing to do that, OP dodged a bullet because who knows what else he was willing to do. This guy is unhinged. You can't kill a creature someone you love cares about like that and have any shred of empathy in your body. I hope OP gets far, far away from this monster. Oh my god. My initial rage is extreme. Anyone who could kill another person's pet, no matter what that pet is, belongs in the garbage. I doubt the police would take a spider's murder seriously, but I feel like I'd have to try. Agnes just saved her life one last time. Anyone psychotic enough to violate you like that will surely escalate anytime something doesn't go their way. Thank you for your sacrifice, Agnes. This. It doesn't matter what Agnes was, it matters that when OP chose Agnes over their boyfriend, the boyfriend decided to kill Agnes rather than compromise. This is an extremely dangerous, angry, abusive individual. Agnes's death allowed OP to discover that before moving into an abusive home. Agnes may very well have saved OP's life. 
I just realized that the spider who has been living in my bathroom has disappeared, and I'm a little sad. He wasn't even a pet, and he either moved on of his own accord, or reached the end of his natural life. Can't imagine what it feels like to have an actual pet deliberately harmed this way by what was supposedly a loved one. Our next post is titled, How do I, 69 male, tell my son, 48 male, that I want to be part of his life again, even if he is gay? I feel that I should preface by saying that I'm not the typical type to ask the internet for advice on such a personal issue, or any issue. But the unfortunate thing I've come to realize is that I can't discuss this with anyone that I know. I'm in my late 60s, and my son is in his late 40s. For relevant context. His mother and I divorced when he was young, and for all intents and purposes, I essentially raised him as a single father from a certain point forward. I did my best to raise him well and be sure that he had everything he needed, but I worked a lot of hours and was very career focused. I realize now that I was somewhat absent. I'm also fairly emotionally reserved in general, at least when it comes to physically speaking. I'm better at writing. When he was in high school and in college, he had several girlfriends, and one girl I thought he was very serious about for the majority of his time during his undergraduate education. They broke up. After that, he never brought home any more girls or talked about any, and he moved away to attend medical school, and we stopped talking as much as we had previously. I remember very distinctly one time while he was visiting from a break from school, I was worried about him, and I had asked if he was on drugs. He just looked physically ill and in a poor state. He assured me it was just stress from school and he would be fine. But I remembered this clearly because this visit home was when I first started to think he could be gay. Now the thing is, my son has never told me that he is gay, even to this day, but it has become an unspoken acknowledgement between us. He has a roommate, that's how we mutually refer to him, and he's had the same friend for a long time. Sometimes I will ask about him, but the answers are always short. Basically, that he is doing well. I think I know maybe five things about this friend after almost 20 years, maybe longer. We speak on the phone occasionally, as we live far away, and this is something we never discuss much, if at all. Recently, I've been doing a lot of thinking. I think I'm a poor father. Somewhere down the line, I taught my son that we can't speak about who he is. I'll admit I'm not the most averse in this kind of lifestyle thing, but I don't want to be shut out from his life. I want to tell him that whatever this is, he is perfectly fine in my book, and I love him. I want to know him and his friend, but I don't know how to tell him or what to say. I'm not sure if I should say boyfriend, as again, he has never said anything to me about being gay. I've just pieced it together over time, so I'm not sure if that's what I should say. Should I just spontaneously bring this up with him? There never seems to be a good time to say what I'm thinking, and the topic seems too serious to send an email or very long text message. I'm not sure if a written mode of communication would be too informal or make it seem that I don't care. At that, I'm not sure where we should go from there. And now in the comments. Since the two of you are so emotionally distant, I recommend writing him a letter. Give him a chance to go through his first set of emotions privately. If you haven't spoken this way to him before, he may need some time to think about his response. Things you definitely want to include, everything you said here about loving him how he is, how proud you are of him, how you regret being distant and closed off to him, and that you were sorry that you never built a close relationship with him. Things not to say, no demands of his forgiveness, though it's okay to ask. Don't push for a do-over. If he decides he would like to get closer, then you'll be building up from where you are now. Give him a chance to respond before you push for a bright new future. Good luck. And definitely don't use the word lifestyle. You said you were better with writing. I think writing a letter where you say everything you've said here and give it to him in person would be amazing. As a straight man whose father is very emotionally closed off, I would love to receive something like this from him, just to know that he is proud of me and loves me and to admit he hasn't been a perfect father. I think in your son's situation, this would be twice as valuable. I hope I can read a follow-up on this in the future to hear how it went. Indopi replies, Thank you for your response. This resonated strongly with me. 
I think I'm a lot like my own father, and if he had ever had a conversation like this with me, it would have changed a lot about our relationship. We live far away, so unfortunately meeting in person won't be a reality for a while, but I feel inspired to write him a letter and mail it. Since you will be mailing it instead of handing it, maybe try to make it as special and sweet as you can. This might sound very cringy or whatever, but maybe try to put little things in the envelope. Maybe a picture, preferably in the proper paper and all, and tons of references to the fact that you were very proud of him and that you really wish to be a part of his life, that you have realized that you have been absent and that you want to change that. Make this letter unique, since it will be an important turning point and since it will probably be a letter that your son will read over and over and probably keep for a long time. Your intentions are marvelous. I hope everything goes well. Don't refer to his boyfriend as his boyfriend, but definitely express your reflections to him the next time you see him, eye to eye. I think the paragraph where you wrote, recently I've been doing a lot of thinking, you have written the perfect opener and flow of the conversation. You're a really good writer and a loving dad. Good luck. And now on to the update. I'm thankful for all of the kind advice I received in regard to my first message here. After reading all of your words, I decided I would handwrite my son a letter and send it in the mail as we live across the country. In summary, I wrote about many things, and the letter ended up being much longer than anticipated. I began by discussing some of my experiences with my father growing up and ways I realized I had treated my son similarly. I had wanted to do better than my father, who had moments where he could be cruel. But I failed to realize that being too reserved was also a problem, and I leaned too far in that direction. After his mother left, I was depressed, and I didn't deal with that as well as I should have. I apologized for being absent at work, and for being emotionally unavailable at times when he would have needed me the most. I mentioned I'd like to change that in the future, but it's still something that's hard for me to do, and I understand he may need his own space. Then I wrote about how even though I probably don't show it well, I do love him with my entire being. There is nothing he could do or be that can change that, and I'm proud of him for many things. I wrote that, by extension, I love whoever he loves, and his chosen family is family to me as well. All said and done, the letter was several pages long. Then I mailed it, and it was incredibly hard to wait. I decided to text him and let him know that I had sent him a letter as we don't typically write, and it seemed like something that warranted some warning in advance of its arrival so he wouldn't be entirely caught off guard by it. Eventually, he sent me a text that he would like to call me at the end of the day. We spoke about everything in the letter. I learned that he had believed I viewed him as a burden, which was disheartening to me as I had always wanted to be a father since I was young, and I never saw him as being a burden which I told him. We discussed his mother and the plethora of feelings surrounding her. This was a hard topic for me, as I still have many unresolved feelings here. But I realized because of this, I never explained to him everything that happened. I also learned that he was afraid to disappoint me, and that he had put a lot of effort into his career to make me proud of him, as he felt this was the way to impress me, and that it would make up for his defects. I brought up that focusing on work over family and interpersonal relationships was one of my bigger regrets, and he admitted that being so career-driven was straining his personal life. With everything going on at the moment, he also expressed that the medical profession was weighing on him, but he hadn't wanted to disappoint me by not being as emotionally strong as he thought I am. By this point in the conversation, we both had said a lot of very emotional things. He brought up that he felt it was hard to talk to me because I don't make it clear what I'm thinking, and so he felt it was always easier to only discuss work or accomplishments with me, and nothing personal. He felt it was easier to let his relationship be an unspoken understanding between us, as he felt I would be uncomfortable to know anything more. At this point, I confirmed that his friend is in fact his partner. He said he felt a lot of shame about it. I told him I regretted not reaching out to him sooner that I'm sorry that my lack of availability had created this distance between us, and that I am always proud of him, and not just of his career. We ended the conversation by discussing seeing each other in person, as it had been almost 10 years since we've actually seen each other. I expressed that I would like to fly out to visit him and his partner, if he would feel comfortable. We are fully COVID vaccinated. 
I now have a plane ticket for early next month, a date which is quickly approaching. I'm glad for all of the encouragement that I received from this website. I have nothing but gratitude for all of your kind words. Once again, I'm asking for a little advice. I have never met his partner in person, nor have I ever spoken to him. He has been with my son for two decades at this point, and likely knows him better than I do. I would like to make a good impression with him. However, I don't know any gay couples aside from them, and as was thankfully pointed out in my previous post, here I am not aware of all the proper ways to describe things, as I incoherently used the term lifestyle. I would like to be invited into their lives, so I wish to avoid offending either of them. Are there any suggestions of common things I should avoid saying to them? Perhaps I'm just nervous because this is coming up soon and I haven't seen my son in so long. Typing some of this out was helpful in and of itself. And now in the comments, your thoughtfulness here made me cry. Be yourself. It seems like you expressed a lot during the call and letter and it cleared a lot of beliefs you had about one another. I agree with the previous poster. Just be straightforward at the start. Say you were trying to get this right, and if you say anything wrong, you are asking them to point it out to you because you were not meaning to offend and want to be sure to not do it again if you can help it. I'm sure they are just as nervous about seeing you and getting to know you, so just go in as open as you can be. I'm proud of you. Even though you're a stranger, I am so proud of the steps that you've already taken. Know you are someone worth knowing, sir. I know this isn't the most detailed advice, but it is honest advice. Just do your best. Remember that his partner is extremely important to him and to pay him all respect. I'd also suggest that you keep your trip on the shorter side. You have not seen each other in 10 years. That's a lot. Just focus on catching up, have some good meals together, and try to make some good memories. Maybe just a long weekend. Keep it light, simple, and fun. You're his father, but you're not his boss anymore. He's 48 years old. He has long graduated from needing parental guidance. Maybe approach him more as an old friend. Good luck. And OP says, Thank you. I'm definitely only staying a few days as I wouldn't want to overwhelm any of us. It's hard not to see him as my little one any longer, but I do respect that he's an adult and I would never mean to try and control him. I like the idea of approaching the situation as meeting up with an old friend. Much less pressure and more casual. I came to add this about keeping the trip short, and also I wouldn't stay at their house unless they really want you there. A nearby hotel so that everyone has a chance to breathe and regroup at the end of the day would be better. Maybe ask them what they would honestly prefer, and take their lead. But your post made me weepy. Well done, you. My girlfriend told me she's pregnant, but I am sterile. Backstory. I got into an accident after my college and will never be able to have kids. None of my family members know of this. They know about the accident, but not about this. I have always wanted to be child free, so it did not affect me much mentally. I have finished my master's degree last year and never dated before. I got a very high paying job directly through campus placements. My parents immediately wanted me to get married after getting a job, but I wanted to work on myself and explore a bit. They said no, and I said that it was my wish. All my life I did what they wanted, and for the first time when I talked against them, they were not happy. This was last year, and they gave up after COVID started. So I picked up some dating apps and went through them, but no luck. Then my parents introduced me to a family friend's daughter, and we clicked kinda. Looking back, I was a fool. She said yes to anything I said, and never complained about anything. I felt kind of weird about it. I wanted her to express her interests, but she always said she was interested in whatever I do. Well, I didn't think much about it. I said that I won't have kids ever, and she surprisingly said okay. I was like, damn. She's probably the one, as it's very hard to find a partner who is child-free in my country, or at least I thought. But we were in the initial stages, and I had not told her about my accident. Long story short, we had sex a month ago. I used condoms because safety first. The next day on, she started ghosting me a bit. I thought it was due to my performance in bed and wanted to give her some space. Then she texted infrequently and only replied okays and k's and one line answers. I thought maybe she wanted to end the relationship and was sad, but I left it at that. 
Yesterday, all her family came to my house, and she claims she's pregnant and the father is me. Needless to say, I freaked the F out and wanted to collapse on the ground. I did not say anything while they were talking about marriage and stuff that needs to happen because I got her pregnant. Please advise me on what steps to take now, Reddit. Now in the comments, you do not have to marry this person. You do not have to keep your parents happy. They sound super selfish and manipulative. You do not have to do anything that you don't want to. Get tested and confirm that you, in fact, can't have kids, do not sign the birth certificate, get advice from an attorney as soon as you can, and stay safe. You could get tested to confirm that you are truly sterile. You may want to try speaking with her privately to let her know you are physically incapable of being the father. You may have to reveal your sterility to both of your families. And OP also comments, thank you for the advice. I will tell them about me being sterile and also using condoms. I just feel like crap because I have to tell my parents about this and they won't like that they won't have grandkids. Depending on how much damage you've got down there, you'll want to first absolutely confirm that you're still sterile and it's not possible. Then you'll want to cut and run. Nah, he needs to mention this first before they get ahead too far. The girl's actions are suspicious, and maybe she's cheating on the side and just wants to get married, as per her parents' wishes, and keep the affair on the side. Yeah, it is hella suspicious, but I've heard plenty of stories from people who were sure 100% that they couldn't get pregnant on account of the guy's infertility, and then suddenly they wound up having a child and the paternity test showed that it was totally theirs. If OP can take an afternoon to get a quick reassessment, he'll be extra sure before dropping the bomb. OP, hear me out on this because I haven't seen anyone mention this yet, but I feel like this was a setup or a trap. I think she may have already been pregnant and your parents' friends knew this and took the opportunity once your parents mentioned something about setting the two of you up. Your parents may have very well known that she was pregnant too. She also could have had conversations about the whole plan the night before the two of you had sex, and it did seem very clear that it was a scheme on your parents' part so they could have a grandchild. I have no clue what country you're in, but whatever you do, do not allow your name on that child's birth certificate. I would make that very clear, because if you were listed as the father, then you could very well be on the hook financially taking care of that child. Also, I do believe you when you stated that you were sterile, but this does not happen to men sometimes where they think they are shooting blanks, but they still had some sperms in there. And it only takes one to get a woman pregnant. So there is a possibility that this child is yours, even if it is a less than a 10% or 1% chance. As someone else said, it certainly isn't zero, and you don't have clarification from a doctor at the moment to let you know your odds. In fact, I would recommend doing a check of your sperm count to verify. If you give a sample, there should not be any sperms in there when it's checked by a doctor. But get doctor to confirm all this for you and come clean with everyone about your sterility. Also, someone made a comment that you can do a non-invasive paternity test as early as 8 weeks. So by the end of next month, I think you can get a paternity test done. Make sure you do both by the way. The doctor's visit for your sterility and the paternity test so you know 100% sure either way. And... Please give us an update once you know, because I'm rooting for you as a fellow child-free person, and I'm hoping this works out in your favor. The next update I hope to see if you are not the father. Best of luck. And now, on to the update. Let me start off by saying I am very, very grateful for all the Redditors who took their time to read and give me advice. I was overwhelmed by the amount of comments and how many of you said it might not even be my kid. Looking at it from a different perspective gave me much more insight on the whole situation. I called my boss and took today off. I called up some clinics to get tested and was given a slot on Friday afternoon. Then I went to the store and bought some pregnancy tests and asked her to come over to my place tomorrow, i.e. today morning. I also called my parents and before I said anything, my mom asked if I had any good news. I was shocked by what she said and asked her what exactly she was talking about. She then played dumb, and I knew that the situation was more screwed than I thought. I cut the call and I cried all night till 3am, grown ass man crying for the first time since 8th class. She came to day morning with her parents, even after I told her to come alone. They were under the impression that I was going to discuss engagement plans with them. I told them to wait outside and called her in, and they threw a fit. 
I told them they can all go back or let her come alone inside, and they said okay. I took out the pregnancy tests and gave it to her, and told her to prove that she was actually pregnant, and told her where the bathroom was. She started screaming at me. She's never done this before, and I was shocked at this. Then she went out the door and called her parents in. Now everyone is screaming at me in my own home because I asked her to prove the pregnancy, not even a DNA test. I told them to all F off, and one hour later, my parents and they all came to my house and they spilled the beans. She was never actually pregnant, as many Redditors said, my parents were afraid that I was getting too old for marriage and wanted me to marry and give them grandchildren. They said that in arranged marriages, there is no need for the people to actually get to know the spouse because parents choose only the best for their kids. They planned this all and were only waiting for me to have sex with her to do this. I broke down and cried again. All my life, I did exactly what my parents wanted. Always scored high and never asked for anything. I told them to get out and to never talk to me again, in between crying, and they said parents know what's best for their kids and I should do what they say. Then I got extremely angry and I told them to F themselves in my native language, which was very bad. For once, I think they knew that I was serious with them and they all left. I blocked them all before sending my parents a message to never again contact me in my life, even if one of you is dying. I cried for some more time, I went through some dog videos, and went through all my messages on Reddit, and I feel like I owe you guys this update because it was you guys who helped me do this. That is all, and I hope you have a wonderful day. And now in the comments, I am so incredibly sorry that you were treated like this. They beyond disrespected your trust and autonomy. Nobody deserves that, especially from the people who claim to love them. I'm glad you cut them out of your life and know, from personal experience, that it is never an easy decision to make. I hope that you find peace and happiness going forward in life, and would recommend looking into therapy to help you process things. I guess the girl would say that she had a miscarriage after you get married, and all parties would be satisfied except you. OP, don't let your parents influence your life or make decisions in your place anymore. You are a grown-ass man, live your life, and learn from yours or others' mistakes. Good luck. I'm glad this situation is resolved for now, but everything is still fresh and they may not be done yet. I don't know anything about India, a lot of people are guessing in the comments, but here in the USA, I have seen instances of women not only faking pregnancies to get married, but announce that they are getting married before they even told the guy they were pregnant in the first place to blackmail with peer pressure. Is that a thing that would happen there? Could you and the girl's parents announce and plan the wedding anyway to try and force you now that the pregnancy scan didn't work? Is there a possibility for the family to pester you at your home? What about going after you at work? I would still go through with all the new sterile testing that you have planned. If you are still sterile, you'll have proof for your parents. If something is healed, see about a vasectomy, or even get one anyway if you're sterile. Unless your testicles are completely removed, sterility is never truly 100%. Only 80-90% to chance that you can't have kids. Vasectomies aren't 100% either, but doubling up with the two 90% effective roadblocks can't hurt. And 10 days after that post, OP provides an additional update. I want to thank you all for taking your time and reaching out and giving advice. The last few days, I feel like a burden was lifted off me, especially from my parents who always expected many things from me. The first day after the confrontation was a crap show. My parents forced relatives to reach out to me, asking me to see reason. I declined. They stopped after two days after a harsh message from me requesting no contact. I also took appointments for family planning, vasectomy, which is next month. Some people asked if I would ever tell my family about this, but I will not. My body, my business. I will of course tell potential future dates that I am child free and also had a vasectomy beforehand. Some people ask where I'm from. I am from India. And now in the comments, this is so abusive, manipulative, and devastating. I'm happy for you that you did the smart thing and were able to stick up for yourself to your family, especially in a culture that makes it so hard. It's time to start living your life, no contact with toxic family. Holy crap, man. Just read your previous post. Stay strong. I was also born in India and obviously have Indian parents. I too do not want children, which is very weird in our culture, but F culture, it's my choice. 
I married a non-Indian girl from New Zealand, so parents didn't want to agree to that too. I just had to make a stand and marry who I wanted. It's been seven years since we got married, and other than my mum, everyone is cool with it. My mum still doesn't talk to my wife. I have a good relationship with my mum though, and we have just agreed to move on with them to not talking to each other. I used to care a lot about what others think and everyone's happiness, and then realised that no one was happy. So I decided to make sure that I'm happy, and my wife is happy, and everyone else can worry about their own happiness. It was difficult for like six months, and then everyone fell into line. Your parents seem even worse than mine. Just remember, it's okay to move away from family if they are toxic. Just because they gave you birth, doesn't mean you owe your life to them. I know it's not an Indian way of thinking, but you gotta move on with times and live your life your way. Good luck, and it's okay to cry as a grown man. It's another Indian thing that grown men don't cry. F that. Crying can make you feel better, and it's good for your mental health. Don't buy into that macho bullcrap. Man, child-free and Indian? That's a surefire way to get all the relatives involved in relentlessly trying to change your mind. Been there and heard that. Yeah, I can speak for what it's like there, but my Indian friend had to literally move continents to get away from the relentless hounding from her family after she told them she didn't want kids. She's almost 40 and says she won't go back until she's in menopause, lol. Oh yes, it's just because we are continents away that we have been spared the full brunt of this. If we were in India, it would have been much worse. Unexposed is titled, Am I the asshole for revealing to my dad's wife the real reason why me and Tim were never close? So my dad practically gave me up to his sister from the moment that I, 27 male, was born. My mum died when she was giving birth to me, and my aunt told me he never recovered from that because he blamed me for her dying. It hurt a lot as a kid that at family events he would ignore my existence. When I was a little older, he got more vocal about me killing her, and he can't stand to look at my face. You can imagine the amount of therapy that put me in. I used to go to church crying because I was scared about going to hell for doing that to my mum. That's how much his words screwed me up. But the shitty part was that I never stopped trying to be accepted by him. After my high school graduation, he told me to never bother him again since he legally has no obligation to me anymore, since he was sending my aunt money to take care of me. Around that time is when I finally started accepting that reality, so from there on, we moved on with our lives. My aunt doesn't talk to me about him. Sometimes my grandparents do, and that's how I found out he got married. They were mad he didn't invite me to their wedding, but to me, it didn't matter because we are not close. But it was his wife who wanted to meet me. It's the first time ever that he wants to make contact, and it was pretty much to say that she wants me in their life. She doesn't know the real reason about why we are estranged, and he asked me to please not say anything, and maybe this could be a way to reconcile after all. But he was only doing it for her. That much was clear when we talked. I never said I would be. He still insisted on us meeting at their place because she really wanted to meet me. All she thinks is we were estranged for not getting along in my teenage years, going to college, and losing touch because of life stuff. It pissed me off that he played it off as us not talking for petty reasons, meanwhile the actual reason damaged me for years. I told her the truth, everything he said to me, that he was never apparent to me, that was all my aunt. It was definitely a shock for her. The outcome was a disaster. Everyone has heard about this now. My grandma in particular told me she understands my anger, but this was his chance at finding someone since losing my mum, and now it's been put in jeopardy. My dad is devastated. They think it was going too far to ruin his marriage that way when he was willing to include me in their lives, which could have been the start of our relationship. And they say not only did I ruin that, but also possibly wrecked his marriage. She just doesn't agree at all with what he did, and it could have been avoided if I didn't say anything. For me, it was hard not to tell the truth after the lies made. It seems like it was nothing serious. I couldn't ignore what happened after what it did. I don't know if it was the right call, since it put their whole marriage at risk after all. And now in the comments, Dude, not the asshole. Your dad is a grade A double cheese asshole from hell with a special topping of asshole served with asshole sauce. He deserves every bit of what happened to his second marriage because he presented himself as a different person than he is. I am sorry that you had to go through this. I wish you strength and may you find more people who love you unconditionally. 
And OP says, thank you. And don't worry, I have. My aunt has been the best parent for me, and she always tries to shield me from this crap as much as possible. I don't know if I would have made it without her supporting me. Keep it that way. As for your grandparents and your dad, just tell them, I didn't do anything. He did it to himself. He blamed a helpless child. He was a deadbeat and got caught in his web of lies, and that is why his marriage is in trouble. You all care about his happiness, but where were you all when he was blaming me and making my life miserable? He doesn't get a pass for that. This is it. This is the answer, OP. He ruined his own marriage. That's a consequence he has to face for choosing to treat you like crap for something you are not responsible for. That's right, OP. You are not responsible for what happened, no matter what your father might try to tell you. Your mother's death was tragic, but it was no one's fault. Him repeatedly blaming you, his child who wasn't even born yet, for killing her is screwed up. Something not many people understand is that you might go through trauma, but that doesn't give you a free pass for putting others through the same. You can be a victim and a villain at the same time. Losing his wife to things out of his control is hard, but he is still in the wrong for treating you badly, and he will be held accountable for it. You did nothing but tell your stepmother the truth. A relationship that can be ruined by a simple truth is a relationship built on lies. Simply knowing that my husband is an absent, horribly cruel father who has no intentions of changing would be an instant deal breaker for me. But knowing that he lied about it for our whole relationship so I wouldn't walk away is just... wow. Thing is, leaving would entirely be your stepmother's choice. One you cannot make for her. She deserves to know the true man that she married, which is exactly what you gave her. Your dad can't blame you for that. And also, this bit... They think it was going too far to ruin his marriage that way when he was willing to include me in their lives. For one, he needs to quit saying that you ruined his marriage, because you didn't. He did. More importantly though, the way he talks about your involvement in his life is pissing me off. He's acting like including you in his life is a sacrifice he has to make, a favor to you. But it's neither. You don't owe him anything. He should be the grateful one, being thankful that you were even open to reconciling the relationship. And now onto the update. Words can't express how much it meant to me getting so much love from my last post. Everyone who supported not just my actions, but also acknowledged the hurt. To all the sweet internet mums who commented and DM'd me, y'all know how to make someone feel loved, even by total strangers, lol. Since so many people wanted an update, here it is. It's a little heavy, and for a couple days, I needed some time to process it and do some crying. They are splitting up. I heard it first from my grandma, then from his wife, or I guess, ex? She was legit crying on the phone when she called to tell me, sorry for putting me in that position. Her and my dad had a longer conversation, where he told her everything else he did, so she made that decision she can't stay with someone like him and she wanted me to know how disgusted she is. Also to tell me thanks, which is something I really needed to hear. My dad is who he is, yeah, but regardless, two people splitting their marriage because of what you said is a hard thing not to feel guilty about. This lady is heartbroken going through divorce just a few months after getting married, and she wanted to take the time to reassure someone else that they made the right choice. Unexpectedly though, my dad wanted us to talk yesterday too. My girlfriend again didn't want me to. Trust me, I get her point. She's the one who didn't want me having dinner with them in the first place. For one thing, we didn't know what he wanted to talk about and what that would do to my mental health. It was probably a bad risk to take, but I met with him. And yeah, I should listen to my girlfriend more when it comes to this stuff. First time in my life I think we had a conversation about my mom. How much he loved her, them being happy and excited about having a family, but then she died, and he told me even if it's wrong, he can't never not blame me because simply, if I hadn't been born, she would still be here. He's only sorry for not completely staying away from me and saying horrible things growing up. While he wasn't saying this to be malicious, since he seemed sincere, it was still an ouch for me. In the end, we decided having a relationship with each other was never going to happen and said goodbye. He at least apologized for trying to put me in that position. First good thing that he ever did was to tell me what happened with his wife wasn't my fault. Then I just went home and cried. 
had my day to process a short therapy session and support from both my aunt and girlfriend to get me through. The rest of my family is leaving me alone at least, so glad that in the end it was resolved. Not a total happy ending I know, but in the end, it's better this way. And now in the comments, his late wife would be ashamed of him. This is what I was thinking. I would never stay with a man who had done this. What if wife too got pregnant and died during birth? How could you stay with someone who you know for an effing fact would abandon your child together? Opie, you did this woman a favor. Your father still has a lot of growing up to do because, based on his flawed logic, it is all his fault for getting her pregnant, but that's besides the point. I hope life gets better from now on, and it's great that you have your aunt and girlfriend's support. I hope you're able to heal from all the damage he's done to you. Right? I don't think it's healthy to live a world of what ifs. At the end of the day, you can't change the decision that you've made. But the thing is, mum and dad made the decision. Decisions to have a child, what hospital to go to, etc. Does that mean she deserved to die for the decisions they made? Obviously no, but OP literally wasn't even born yet. There was no wrong choices OP made, they literally didn't exist in the world yet to make those choices. He completely dishonored his wife's memory. I'm sure she would have wanted her child raised by a loving father. I almost died having one of my kids. It was such a comfort to me knowing that they would at least have my husband. I would be devastated if my kids were raised like this. Dude has to have mental issues. He told me, even if it is wrong, he can't ever not blame me because simply, if I hadn't been born, she would still be here. Mother Effa, the kid wouldn't be born if you didn't knock your wife up. That's how this works. How anyone can blame anyone else for being born is beyond me. Yeah, I have a distant, in terms of DNA, as people we were quite close. He died when I was 10, but before that he often took me for weekends so that I could hang out with his grandkids on his farm, relative, who lost his wife in childbirth. He was understandably devastated, and yes, his sisters moved in with him for a few years so he would have support but he always considered his live son to be the last gift she had ever given him. He admitted when drunk that he blamed himself because he had wanted another baby. He had two daughters, although they were under five when they lost their mother, and had been teasing his wife that he wanted a boy this time. Back then, you couldn't tell the sex before birth, so he got told it was a boy very soon before being told his wife was bleeding out and things looked grim. But blame his son? Never. Sober or drunk, he always maintained that his children were the greatest blessings, and he was grateful to have them. Am I the asshole for not clearing the air between my teenage daughter and her boyfriend? I, 44 female, have an 18-year-old daughter. I raised her with cheating being the worst thing to do to a person. My daughter is usually well-behaved and agreed that infidelity was bad. My daughter has never been the type to be in a relationship until a few months back. She told me that she was in a long distance relationship with a boy she knew for about three years now. I do not have a problem with her boyfriend. I've talked to him here and there. He is nice and respectful. And whenever she talks about him, it's always in a good light. In the second month, she gave him my phone number in case of emergencies. Her contact for him is love of my life. She is very open about these things to me. The problem arose when one day she received a text from a different messaging platform, which was Discord. She asked me who it was from and to read it to her since she was begging. It was from a weird name that wasn't her boyfriend's name being affectionate with her. My stomach dropped and I opened the phone and there was affectionate texts back from her side. I put down the phone and excused myself. I felt so angry with myself, and in the moment, messaged her boyfriend, warning him that my own daughter may be cheating on him. Shortly after, my daughter came rushing to me angry and sobbing, saying her boyfriend had broken up with her because of something I had said. I told her what I found and what I did, and scolded her that I taught her better. She then took a deep breath and explained the name I saw was her boyfriend's username and that he would text her via Discord if he was playing games on his computer. Here is where I may be the asshole. My daughter begged me to clear the misunderstanding because her boyfriend had blocked her on everything. I refused, telling her that if she wasn't cheating, he wouldn't go to such lengths and that this all could still be a lie. If this was the case, why didn't she just have him under the same contact as his number? 
My daughter has been crying in her room, claiming that she really did love him, and now I'm wondering if I did the wrong thing by not clearing the air. I just think because this is the first relationship, she can reflect on this and better herself later. Am I the asshole? Now in the comments, um, you're probably the biggest asshole and worst mother to exist, in all honesty. Sorry not sorry, you're the asshole. You were also an asshole before you said, this is where I may be the asshole. You're the asshole. You should keep your nose out of situations that don't call for it. Also, you clear the air because you made an ass out of yourself and your daughter looks terrible now on account of your ignorance. Nobody on Discord has their actual name as their username, by the way. Why wouldn't you have asked her who that was? Do you have so little trust in your daughter doing the right thing that your mind automatically went to cheating? Shame on you for breaking up a happy couple. That was her first love, and you just trounced on everything due to paranoia. You'll be lucky if this doesn't permanently affect your relationship with your daughter. Make things right. And a friend of OP's actually weighs in and says, you're the asshole. Even using a throwaway account, I had to make a new account so you didn't find my main account. If you don't know me, I'm your daughter's best friend, and I know for a fact this is you because your own daughter was completely in shambles. I have known both of them for a while, and yeah, your daughter was never the type for relationships because of you. You put it in her head that the world was going to cheat her out of happiness. She would never cheat on him, and FYI, he is completely destroyed. I'm going to give you a day to fix this yourself so you can repair whatever relationship you have with your daughter before I clear the air for them. They are the two nicest people I've ever met. Because they were only dating for a few months? Wrong. They've known each other for a little more than three years. This guy is completely in love with your daughter and would do anything to keep her happy. Your daughter would do the exact same thing. They have loved each other more than months and you completely demolished it. The fact that they are both completely destroyed by one person is so cruel. You're the asshole. Fix it. Just do it. Don't wait another day for this hot mess to come around. Send him screenshots. Please send him screenshots. Also, I am so, so sorry this is happening to your friend. I called him and it was heartbreaking to hear that he was clearly crying and upset. This guy is literally the nicest dude ever, and I was really happy when my friend and him got together. I showed him this post, and he's rightfully clearing his head. He is so in love with her, the first thing he wanted to do was call her and apologize. But I told him not to, and to wait for the video call that OP is going to hold. It wasn't his fault for the way he reacted, and I hope OP realizes his actions were justified, and he did absolutely nothing wrong. I hope so as well. I hope they'll be okay as a couple and only come out closer for this horrific evening they've just had to endure. You're the asshole. You inserted yourself into a situation and ruined her relationship and then refused to fix the mess that you made. I hope this is a joke and that you're trolling because I find it hard to believe an adult woman would be this ignorant. Stop projecting your own issues onto your daughter. You absolutely did the wrong thing. Also, it's easy to have multiple usernames on Discord. That's like a huge point of the platform. You literally could have Googled this, but instead, you chose to be cruel to your own child. Good job. And now back up to the post, there is an edit. With the fast replies of telling me I'm the asshole, I'm attempting to fix it. Thank you for your replies and snapping me into reality where I've betrayed my own daughter in the worst way possible. Thank you. I'll leave a proper update later on when time passes if you are all interested later. Again, Thank you. And now on to the update. I made an Am I the Asshole post, and I realized I screwed up. I royally screwed up. My daughter was still completely distraught, and her best friend reached out to me. I legitimately cried when I realized I had betrayed my daughter. I sat down with her. She was more disappointed and sad than mad at me, which honestly made it harder to look her in the eyes. I was wrong. I admitted full fault and told her I would clear the air and do anything to get her to forgive me again. She stopped crying shortly after I told her that I'd try to fix it. I messaged her boyfriend and asked if he was okay to video call both of us so I can clear things up. He was at work, so the video call will happen later tonight. I told my daughter that I'm going to look for therapy and suggested family therapy if she was up for it. 
She told me she would go if I got individual therapy first. I deeply apologized to her over and over, with both of us crying. I realized that because it has only been us two, I had an unhealthy attachment to my daughter. Her father did cheat on me, but he passed away shortly after I figured out I was pregnant. I was distraught, and as a single mother, put ideas into my daughter that would later on be damaging to her mental health without me knowing. I'm not making excuses, but I did have cheating-related trauma to the people who did assume correctly. My daughter had informed me that she would never cheat, and she's not going to cut me off. I offered, since she is 18 now, that I could co-sign off on an apartment if she wanted for a while, or if she wanted to go to her relatives to get away from me, I would let her. She declined on all the offers, and told me all she wanted was me to fix a relationship that I had broken. I hope the video call goes well. Update 2. I find this heartbreaking that I've inflicted a delusion in my own daughter's head that no matter what I do, I would never hurt her. I did hurt her. She's not angry at me or disappointed at all, she's just happy that I believe her and I'm willing to fix things. This almost brought me to tears. I need her to understand that what I did was hurt her. I want her to understand that she can't be treated like this, not even by her own mother. Is there any suggestions? To essentially tell her what I did to her was completely horrible, and that I'm capable like anyone else of hurting her. I'm devastated that in some way, no matter what I do, she won't ever see it as hurting her. How do I undo this? Or should I leave it alone? Update 3. I set up a video call with her boyfriend on the laptop. Me and my daughter were sitting across from each other, and upon answering, I see this poor boy's face with his eyes puffy and swollen, as if he's been crying for a while. My stomach turned, and I felt like throwing up when the first words from him were, Where is blank? And I turned the screen to show him my daughter, in which he burst out into tears apologizing to her. I felt like vomiting, not because I was spiteful or anything, but that I clearly put these two through so much unnecessary stress. I explained everything, I showed him the post I made, I told him the username that I saw. I told him everything and admitted I was wrong. I didn't want pity. I screwed up. I got through everything and both of them let me get through the whole thing. I didn't try to excuse my actions because there is no excuse great enough to even cover anything I did. Honestly, the fact they sat there without interrupting me shows me both of them are so mature and I am truly thankful. The boyfriend apologized to my daughter again before talking to me. I sat there without interrupting him. I feel horrible that even though I put them through this, he still remained respectful. Here are some points he brought up. He told me that he's thankful I came clean in the end, but told me rightfully so, that I was so messed up, that I didn't come clean sooner, and that doubling down made the whole situation worse. He brought up that the reason I had his phone number in the first place was so I could text him emergencies, like if my daughter got into an accident, or if something terrible had happened to her, and that I will only use it for that from now on. Anything in their relationship is for them to settle, and I will not interfere any further. He reminded me that he's not going to tell my daughter what sort of relationship she should have with me, and that is for her to figure out. He told me that he forgives me for making this mistake, but if I ever do anything to this extent again, that he will never forgive me again. He said that therapy is something I needed, and to reflect on this. And he told me that he wouldn't blindly trust me anymore, so I shouldn't be surprised if he second-guessed me. He then told me something that made me choke up. You raised a daughter, teaching her that infidelity was bad. She trusted you with everything, even her phone is unlocked to you. Why do you think so little of her to lie like this? I trusted you because you were her mother. There would be no reason for her own mother to lie about something like that. I have seen various comments like this throughout the day, but this one hit especially hard because when he said it, I looked at my daughter and her face looked so betrayed, I almost started crying again. I didn't. This wasn't a time to feel sorry for myself. My daughter said she didn't have a lot of words to say to me, which is fair. It was awkward after a while. The tension felt tight and the air felt dense. Her points were, she didn't feel like she could trust me as much anymore. She doesn't hate me in any way, just more disappointed in me. She told me she was changing her passcode. She told me things would be awkward for a while, but assured me that we'll get through this. 
She's not going to cut contact with me. She's going to take some time before actually forgiving me fully, and she doesn't want money from me, as she feels like that's a way that I'm trying to compensate my behavior. I agree because they were all fair points. I sat there for a while until her boyfriend broke the silence and excused himself, ending the call. My daughter soon followed shortly after, telling me that she has to discuss with him of their relationship privately. Before leaving the kitchen, she softly let out a thank you, and I hope things get better. I'm now sitting here with a lot of things on my mind and emotions. I feel really grateful that my daughter is so much more mature than me because she and her boyfriend never once raised their voice at me. They handled everything so calmly and respectfully. I'm thankful for all the comments that gave me advice to fix this. And now in the comments, glad you're taking ownership of your issues. I truly hope that you get therapy and figure out your pain points so you can have a relationship with your daughter moving forward. No 18 year old should be their mum's best friend. You're an adult and need to keep your drama separate from your daughter. Good luck and I hope it works out for everyone involved. And OP replies, I agree. Best friend was a title that wasn't meant for my daughter. She is my daughter, not a friend. And as her parent, I failed her gravely by hurting her the worst way possible. Well, the good news is that you can learn from this and move towards a better and healthier relationship. Good for you in realizing this and working to make it better. Just use caution to not make her responsible for making you feel better. Let her know that being angry is okay and you can take it. Sometimes kids in these close relationships feel like they have to put aside their feelings to make it better for the parents. Good luck. Understanding there is an issue is the first step to fixing it. Kudos to you for being willing to work through your issues and to fix your mistake. But things like this, if she wanted to go to her relatives to get away from me, I would let her, also have to stop. It reeks of a poor me pity party. My mother was a control freak when I was growing up and pulled that kind of crap a lot. She's in her 60s and still does it, in fact. Every time she was an asshole, it would inevitably end up with her being more upset than the person she had hurt, bawling her eyes out, and being all dramatic. Making comments like, if you want to leave, I understand. Or, if you don't love me anymore, I wouldn't blame you. The end result is that I, the victim, ended up having to repeatedly comfort her, the asshole. Ultimately, she never really had to take responsibility for her shit behavior and is a real treat to deal with as a senior citizen, let me tell you. I wish she had been forced into therapy decades ago. Please, please, put really honest effort into healing your wounds or you'll end up a bitter old lady, like my mum, who was resented by her adult daughter, like me, because there was never an opportunity to resolve any conflict or hurt feelings. And OP replies, Thank you for bringing that up. I only suggested it as not a pity party, but because my daughter is very close to my niece. I suggested she take some time apart from me so she can clear her head and actually realize what she wants. I'm starting to see that a lot of the times she does things to make me feel better. I don't want that I want to grow from this. I feel as if she's too close to me right now to make an actual decision right now. She seems happy with me, but I know if she takes a step back from me, she'll realize what I did to her is horrible. I want her to realize this and stand up for herself in the future. I'm going to work on myself and take steps, making sure I won't do this again, but ideally hope if I do something like this again, she can express herself fully and tell me off. Damn. Reading these Reddit posts honestly just makes me realize how much my mom truly loves me. She would never ever do what you did. Glad you realized how much you screwed up, but it's extremely alarming that you even had this F up in the first place. Crazy that you would even do that to your daughter. I hope you think about your actions long and hard toward her in the future. And this is how trauma is passed on from parent to child. Yeah, even when reading the first post, I was all, WTF? How did this woman come to the conclusion that it's appropriate to talk to her child, apparently at length, and from a young age, about how cheating is bad? I mean, obviously cheating is bad, but how do you, as a parent, get into such a messed up headspace that that is the one of your greatest worries about your child growing up? Not, I hope I raised them with all the tools to make them a happy, well-adjusted adult, 
but I hope I raise them to never hurt a person the way that I was hurt by her father. That is so messed up, and her thinking so badly about her own daughter has probably messed up that young woman more than she realizes now. So much this. I am one of the people who was quick to tell my mum that she had screwed up, she needed to fix it, and she needed therapy. I've been cheated on. It broke my heart and destroyed my world. I have scars. I did not inflict those scars on my sons. Our next post is titled, Husband surprised me with a divorce, cleaned out bank accounts, and shut off credit cards. How could I find an attorney with no money? Tonight, when my husband got home from work, he informed me he wants a divorce and will be leaving until it's done. This is not a huge surprise, honestly. Ever since our daughter was born, we've just not been getting along. What is a surprise is its suddenness. I've been a stay-at-home mom since our daughter was born two years ago. It just didn't make sense to work and spend 90% of what I made on daycare. So when talking to him before he was finished packing, he told me, good luck with the mortgage and bills. I've taken my money out of our bank account and turned off your card on my credit. I would say I was shocked, but I really am not. He is very mean when he's angry and never has seemed to connect with his daughter. He wanted a boy, and from the day we got the word that we were having a daughter, he's been distant. I obviously need an attorney. I logged into our bank account, and sure enough, it's at $5. What resources can I begin looking into to get an attorney for free to help at least make him pay the bills and food until I can find childcare and a job? Is there anything I can do myself with the courts that is semi-quick to at least have him pay for the necessities since he cleaned out our joint account or at least money for an attorney? I understand it's all his money, but we are married with a child. I don't see how he can just leave us with nothing all of a sudden. I'm in Wisconsin. I've tried to Google up the best I could since the little one went to sleep, but I can't find what I'm looking for or even really know what I'm looking for. Thanks for anyone who helps. And now in the comments, contact your local or state bar association. You're not the first person to have this sort of thing happen, and they will have resources to help you get legal representation and also help with other financial matters. Also, if you have bills coming due, would be worth talking to creditors to let them know what's going on. If your husband is on those bills too, his credit will also take a hit from him not paying. Within that framework, it would be in his best interests not to leave you high and dry. And OP says, thanks. Someone else suggested that and I found their website. Most of the bills are in my name. He's on some like the mortgage. You will retain a lawyer who will file for temporary support orders, which will include mortgage, bills, living expenses, and your attorney fees. OP asks, how long will that take usually? I'm about 99% certain he is driving out of state also. I'm not sure if that complicates too much. I think he may have quit his job also because on his Facebook, there are a lot of people saying they'll miss him. So he drained the accounts, abruptly quit his job and walked out? Is he mentally sound? And OP says, he's not crazy or anything, just not friendly for years. He wanted a son. And now on to the update. I wasn't able to get much done over the weekend except sell the wedding ring for some food and diaper money. Today, however, was really busy. I spoke to a few people I was able to get in contact with through legal aid. I'm told by the end of the week, I should be with an attorney who can begin helping me file everything I need to begin doing and hopefully begin tracking down where he's put all of the money and get some back so I can continue to survive until I can be approved for childcare through state benefits and begin working again. I'm really surprised about how often this happens. There are entire places dedicated to helping men and women who have their wives and husbands do this to them. I am filing for divorce, before he can hopefully, and for the return of the money into our account, and in order to continue assisting with bills, child support, and other necessities such as diapers, mortgage, etc. I probably will not have another update to this for a good long time, but so many people wanted to make sure I was going to be okay, and with everyone's advice to contact legal aid, etc., it looks like it hopefully might get better soon. I also contacted the bank about other bills that are coming up that I won't make, and I explained the situation. They are somewhat understanding, and hopefully I'll be back at work soon to keep current. Thanks for everyone's help and advice. And update number two. 
I did all the lawyer stuff they needed, providing things like bank statements to prove the money situation and everything, and we did the filing with the court. Turns out he did quit his job, and before he left, he tried to make things worse by removing his card from the bills that he could, and had the cell phone bill go to a paper bill instead of paperless. And he tried a few other things, but when they wouldn't let him, it now makes sense why he cancelled his credit card and mine. The bill still comes, but since those were in his name, I guess I don't need to worry about that just yet. Now the bad news, sadly, since they don't know where he is, nothing really changes at all, and now I have to wait and see what happens. There is another date over a month away to start the divorce, but apparently that's going to become an issue too, since he needs to be found, or we wait longer again from what I was told. One final fun thing that I'm pretty certain he did, but they won't tell me is, I had two CPS people show up and inform me of allegations that I cannot take care of my child, slash provide diapers or food, etc. Once I explained it all to them and showed them what I had from my lawyer, they seemed to just let it be. I guess partners trying to use them as a way to harass the other isn't anything new to them, except they will still be checking in apparently just to make sure. And now to the third and final update. So it's been an extremely rough couple of months and seems to only keep getting worse, honestly. And I'm sad to say there is no happy ending here. I didn't even want to do an update, but so many people seem to be interested in the original and update. So where to start? Still haven't found him and the legal help I have is really great, but they are also very overworked and the resources needed to track him down just take time to get and more time to find him. As a final parting gift, it seems he claimed our child on his taxes from last year so he could get that tax credit. I was hoping we could track him down that way, but again, sometimes that takes time and resources which technically, since he was the one working and did live with us for over six months of the year, he is technically entitled to in a legal sense. The bank was somewhat kind of understanding during the holidays, but the calls are getting to the point where I'm fairly certain they will begin foreclosure soonish. I really don't know that for certain, but when you don't pay a mortgage for four plus months, they get kind of upset and the circumstances don't matter. Finally managed to get on Snap for food, and it helps a lot, but it's crazy how quickly you realize how much food you eat and your kid eats, and before when money didn't really matter for necessities like food, soap, water bills, and electricity. I managed to get a job that somewhat works for childcare hours, but you quickly start to realize childcare costs as much as you make, so it's like working so you can pay to have your kid watched. Trying to avoid paying all the bills attached to the house so I can save up enough to hopefully get us the smallest, cheapest apartment around and keep working. Sorry for the negative update everyone, but it's just life I guess. Unless things extremely and drastically change for the better, this will be the last update. I'll keep doing my best of course and thanks for all the words in the other posts about the other updates. And now in the comments, people who do this kind of thing are the lowest kind of scum. To deprive your child of necessary items just to spite your spouse, and it's going to hurt him too if she loses the house because I'm sure he's on the loan. Just so stupid. I feel like he was also trying to spite the baby because she was born the wrong sex. What a garbage man. I bet he tries to come waltzing back into his daughter's life in another 5 to 10 years and will expect her to love him but he'll just be worse than a stranger, which I can relate to very much with my own biological father. Or he'll just blame it all on the mother and get mad that the kid doesn't take his side. My dad wasn't quite this bad, but he refused to pay bills until the divorce went through other than the mortgage. Didn't want to wreck his credit, I guess. And then when I was angry at him for not being around and helping with childcare while she was working and going to school at the same time, he acted like it was all her fault. Why should he take any responsibility for his kids? That's her job. The only bright spot in this will be if or when they do find him, he's gonna be screwed. This behavior is indefensible morally, but even less defensible in family court. I don't think he realizes how dim of a view the court takes of being used this way. 
He obviously doesn't want custody, but they're gonna give her child support and likely spousal support, and he can't hide forever. Unless he's willing to change his name and social security number, they'll find him, and they might find him even if he changes everything. As if taking all the money and leaving her and her daughter without enough food was bad enough, he called CPS on her over an issue that was 100% caused by him. What a vile and vindictive person. If OP doesn't have a child, her ex doesn't have to pay maintenance costs. That's the only reason I can think of. Vile man. Joke's on him, because if your kid gets put into foster care in my state, you have to pay child support to the state. Anyway guys, that's where I'm gonna end the episode. I do hope you enjoyed, like the video, comment, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.